Let's go. Welcome to Citizen. We got a very special guest today, former uh, NFL lineman and current C- uh, I got, um, CEO. Not might, might not be the right yeah, thing CEO. to say. Yeah. Uh, power athlete HQ. Uh, how you doing today? Good. Good. Yeah. The the deals uh, just Power Athlete Inc. Uh, I have to have the URL Power Athlete HQ because some asshole's been squatting on powerathlete.com for wow over ten years. How much is he trying to charge you for it? Uh, six figures. What the fuck happened? So I just told them, hey, dude, so I'll own Power Athlete Inc., Power Athlete HQ, and I use everything other than just a a road anything. And the guy's still holding on to it for about the last 15 years. What's his plan? Just to Uh, be a dick? It's under construction. Oh, yeah. And I'll make it not under construction if you give me six figures. I told them just fuck off. Yeah. No no thanks, bud. Yeah. Um, So you're a – I don't think – yeah, we never had you on this show before. You were on Drinking Bros, what, in 2017 or some shit? Yeah. It was a while back. Yeah, and then also, um, I think, in the studio. And then I think I even did a version with uh, Evan and those guys mm-hmm. in, uh, like, some house at some kitchen table. Yeah, like, who knows? Like I mean, an early version of Drinking yeah, Bros, Yeah, it maybe? started in a garage, so you know how it is. Yeah, we were in a <laughs> living room at a house at a table. Do you remember where it was? In Salt Lake City. Oh, okay, yeah, that was probably... Uh, that was probably Jared's place. Yeah. The uh, Unicorn Ranch, I believe, is what we called that. <laughs> Hopefully, you didn't touch anything while you were there. Uh, I didn't, but we or drank you... a lot. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I purposely don't like to do podcasts after a bunch of drinks, <laughs> and we actually drank a lot. Yeah, well. And then the problem was Matt Best showed up real late. and uh, Already I, drunk, probably. I, no, he was sober because mm. I was talking shit to him, and he got real butthurt real fast. <laughs> He's very sensitive. He uh, doesn't want to get – he doesn't like to be out, out drink – Drunk? Yeah. Drink? I don't know well, how you say that. I think it's tough when you show up and everybody's at 100 miles an hour. Oh, yeah. And they're just yeah. fucking on you. <laughs> well, and luckily I, with booze, you can catch up pretty fast. <laughs> yeah. It's not like uh, mushrooms where you got to wait 45 minutes. Yeah. You know what I mean? Exactly. Sure. Um, so you were in, uh, you're, you're originally from Southern California when Correct. it was still cool. Yeah, I grew yeah. up in Southern California, uh, youngest of three boys. Mm. Uh, my dad, uh, you know, grew up in Southern California, moved to, California from actually the Midwest from Kansas, uh, born, you know, childhood depression, 1937. Uh, all of a sudden, World War II starts. My grandfather and all of his brothers and everybody were engineers. Mm-hmm. So they put out this deal for like, come to California, build planes. And they all packed up their cars for the war effort and drove to California. Sure, yeah. And then they all, uh, my dad tells the story or told the story since passed, but they showed up in California. And mm-hmm. they went to the McDonnell Douglas plant. My, uh, he said my granddad went in, came out about an hour later uh, with keys, signed a contract. They gave him a house, and they went. They moved into their new house in Culver City, and my dad lived there uh, his whole life from there. Um, yeah, it's not like that anymore, huh? No, I mean now, uh, now you got to rent. Yeah, <laughs> forever. So yeah, they lived in Culver City, uh, had jobs, were engineers, and worked in the war effort building planes. And uh, my my grandfather ended up. Uh, working in aerospace and ended up developing the honeycomb structure mm. on the space chase. Oh, cool. And then my other uncle. So who, what did he work for, uh, Amico or some shit? No, it was McDonnell Douglas. McDonnell Douglas did yeah. that. I thought, well, no, Amico had made the uh, the outer panels. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, my one of my uh, uh, older relatives. Uh, uh, I think it was my great-grandfather's brother or some shit, or my grandfather's brother maybe, uh, worked for Amico. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so you were grew up in Southern California and then uh, – Obviously, you're a, a massive human being, so you played football, yeah. which is what you did back then, um, and went to uh, to Cal Berkeley. How was that? I mean, what? So I've I've been there. I've done stuff. I almost went there for grad school actually, but uh, after having conversations with people on campus, I'm like, oh man, because this is after the army. I'm like, there's yeah. no fucking way. What, uh, what were you going to go to grad school for? Uh, for uh, uh, it was uh, homeland security stuff, so okay. international homeland security. I ended up going to Penn State instead because they were. Uh, so the the people at um, at Berkeley were more. It was uh, it's hard hard to explain. It, it was less former um, operations people and more like academic people. Mm-hmm. And at Penn State, it was more people who had like worked in Homeland Security for you know for an actual like actually had the job. Mm-hmm. That was the deciding factor. It would have been cheaper technically. To go to Berkeley, because at the time I lived in Oakland, but... Um, oh, yeah, where'd you live in Oakland? In Piedmont, so in not Piedmont, technically uh, Oakland, right? <laughs> yeah, no, I lived at 51st and Telegraph, so I lived in Oakland. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I lived in... Uh, I lived actually on Piedmont Avenue, so... Nice. It's That's hard a beautiful to, place. Yeah, it's not bad. Well, no, I don't know about now, but it's... Well, no, it's still really nice. Yeah. I mean, the Oakland Hills is beautiful. <clears throat> yeah, it is. I mean, Piedmont did it right. They raised their own money and started their own little city inside of Oakland. That was probably a yeah. good idea. Yeah, but yeah it would have been 
in-state tuition there, which for grad school doesn't necessarily matter as much, but it is a discount, but the the VA paid for it, so I didn't really give a shit. I, I went to grad school as well. At Where? Berkeley. At Berkeley? Mm-hmm. How, when, when was this? Uh, so I was there, uh, graduated high school in 94, and mm-hmm. then my first year at Berkeley was in 94, graduated in 97, and then did grad school uh, at the School of Education in 98, mm-hmm. and then got drafted that next year. So you're like a fifth-year senior, basically? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I graduated in four years, and then was able to get my master's. What was the more, master's in? Uh, education. Okay. So I actually had a really interesting experience with it. Uh, did all the classes, and my final graduation or graduate thesis was uh, posed to me by my uh, academic advisor, a guy named Herb Simons. Mm. And the idea was to write a first-person narrative on why NFL players or potential NFL players leave college early to go play in the NFL, which seems very apparent. But he wanted actually to, you know, have me interview people mm. and write like a first person kind of experience of my own, but also interview people. And mm. he's like, you know, uh, I don't want you to hand it in. I want you to go have the experience. And a couple of years later, I want you to come back and like, let's have a discussion mm. and write this. So I was very excited to write it mm. and ended up doing a really good job. Um, lo and behold, uh, in my third year, Herb Simons passes away unexpectedly. Mm. And I reach out to my present academic advisor and said, hey, I got to turn this thing in and got completely stonewalled and I uh, just wanted no part of it. And the reason being was the year before I'd been invited to come back and sit on a panel mm. and I didn't, I didn't read the room very well and it was much too honest and I didn't play the game. And uh, I offended a lot of people that were sitting on the panel just because I kind of was under, under the idea that um, as a current NFL player right. living in this environment, when they asked me questions, I had intrinsic knowledge. Mm. Like, this is what I do. So I was speaking from a, a personal experience, and I didn't realize that telling the truth and actually giving a first-person narrative of what was happening might offend some people. So when Herb <laughs> left, and I even said to Herb, I'm yeah. like, man, people seem pretty upset. He's like, screw it. You're telling the truth. He passes away, and the guy who was uh, the next up in line chose to make an example and would not accept my final thesis. So I ended up never completing it, even though I'd done all the work and wrote the paper. So how do you, uh, how, what's the recourse for something like that? Nothing. Because you, you, I don't think master's coursework were to transfer from one place to another. No. No, so I just have this, uh, I you know, did my master's work, mm-hmm. wrote my thesis, and they never allowed me to hand it in. Well, what was the, what, what was the uh, conclusion of the thesis? Uh, they just stonewalled me every time I no, reached out. No, no, I mean, uh, from, oh, like your, uh, from your position, why oh, do people leave early? Uh, I mean, other than just you know, maximizing, you know. Well, there was twofold. Mm. And the one that hurt people's feeling is I don't necessarily know if education is valued in the black community. Mm. You know, I mean, uh, you know, as a. Uh, it was like a vehicle just to get, yeah. I yeah, mean, I mean, as, as a, you know, like, and this is where we get into an interesting segment of this. But as a, you know, young white middle class kid from mm. you know Torrance Palos Verdes area I grew up with two parents in the home my mom mm. was a stay at home uh, you know mom and uh, she was an accountant my mom's super sharp my dad was a lawyer um, you know when they had kids you know I got two older brothers my mom stayed at home and raised us right my dad worked full-time job uh, you know busted his ass we got up every Saturday washed cars uh, you know, education was very important. My mm-hmm. dad was super smart. Graduated high school at 16, graduated college at like 19, graduated law school at like in his 20s, working a full-time job. So very intelligent, you know, probably a uh, plus 160 IQ. Mm. So to grow up with a really smart, condescending, intelligent lawyer father was pretty good for us. And uh, so for me growing up, I always wanted to be an attorney. Mm. Um, you know, it's all, uh, you know, we'd go to court with my dad, we would help. Uh, you know, he was super hands-on in terms of educating us within not only politics and the law. Like I said, my dad ran for Congress twice. He was a lobbyist in Sacramento. And um, he worked on Richard Nixon's campaign, knew Ronald Reagan. We had an event that Pete Wilson was at our house. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we kind of grew up around it. And I really looked at uh, being an attorney as what I wanted to do. And my brothers as well. But uh, my one older brother went to law school. My other brother went to law school and he practices and he's a criminal defense attorney. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a family business. I see. And uh, so I grew Mm -hmm. up. Uh, with the idea that I was going to go to law school. And next thing I know, I'm six foot, 165 pounds and pretty strong. And mm. next thing I know, I'm six four, two fifty, 250 and, mm. and then grew two more inches in college. And I remember I got something like, you know, a hundred scholarship offers. And as I was looking and visited all these schools, I remember my dad telling me, you know, how many <laughs> middle class white kids, do you know, get a chance to play in the NFL as right. a lineman. And I said, I, I don't know, not that many. And he said, pick the school that you are most proud to hang mm. a degree on the wall. And of all the schools I went to, 
um, Berkeley was by far the best. So I chose yeah. to go there. I it's you you say something like uh, uh, black people going through college that play sports don't necessarily prioritize the education facet of it, and that makes people cringe a little bit. Well, it, but it isn't like it's very true. It's not necessarily a judgment. It just is it, different. Like yeah. people have different priorities. That's not a an insult. Even it's just like well, the, it's, this is what the data shows. Thing. Maybe well, it, it, it was just cultural. Mm. And when I talked to my teammates, and the question I asked them was, when you were little, like, what did you want to be when you grow up? Mm. Every one of them was like, I want to play pro basketball. I want to pro, play pro mm. football. And this I talked to a lot of the white kids, and I mean, some of them had that. Some of them didn't. I want to be a fireman. I want to be an astronaut. Mm. Things that we would consider more normal. I never thought about playing in the NFL. Right, yeah. I mean, there were a few moments that I remember that, like, moved me to want to lift weights. Right, Like, yeah, if, you, if yeah. you have a moment, I'll uh, – there's a thing in Southern California where I grew up called junior lifeguards. Sure, and yeah, It's yeah. like a, yeah. a lifeguard training yep. program you enter when you're about eight or nine mm -hmm. years old. So, uh, you know, I grew up near the beach. We'd ride our bikes, and we did this thing called junior lifeguards. And I was probably 10 or 11 – we were uh, at the aid station working on CPR with the lifeguards, mm -hmm. and I saw this, like, I, th I thought it was a riot. All these people screaming and yelling, and we, like, got up and we walked over to see what it was. And it was an individual walking down the boardwalk, and people were, like, <gasps> like gasping, mm -hmm. turning. Like, it was it like, Arnold? No. <laughs> it was even better. Oh, wow. And this dude comes walking, and he's wearing shorts. He's wearing a tank top. He has, like, a gold chain. The dude's chest was so big he could have sat a drink, and he was <laughs> massive. Easily to over 300 pounds, 6'5". Mm -hmm. And uh, all of a sudden, the dude walks by, and we're like, and we started following him. And he kind of, like, turned and stomped at us, and we ran away like little kids, right? And then he proceeded to run up and down, like, the uh, the big ramp. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was Lyle Alzado. Oh, yeah, yeah. He was a fucking monster, dude. Fucking. Well, I guess that's when. At uh, his peak. Uh, the Raiders were in, uh, in, yeah. in, in LA, LA, right? Yeah. yeah. So he, he was an absolute savage. And I remember thinking. <laughs> I want to lift weights. Yeah. And yeah, that yeah. was kind of the impetus yeah. for me to start lifting weights, but I never thought about playing football. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it, no, that's interesting because, well, let me ask you this. Uh, and may, maybe you don't necessarily know, but from my, like I grew up in a impoverished neighborhood with uh, primarily black and brown people. I was one of the few white kids in the neighborhood. Where, where'd you grow up? Uh, Greenville, South Carolina on okay. the West side. Yeah. It's kind of shitty. Um, now it's actually really nice uh which is well, what gentrification uh well yeah that's how it works right yeah um but yeah it's when i hear something like that my brain immediately goes to um you know people that are in a shitty situation or at least a perceived shitty situa situation it could be both sometimes it's legit sometimes it's not it just depends especially these days we tend to catastrophize everything like i'm not getting what i want sure so society's failed me it's like well maybe that's a possibility. That's one of many possibilities, right? Uh, but the idea of uh, uh, of what it, what it means to be successful, you know what I mean, to, to claw your way out of a shitty situation like that, really we learn about what it takes to do that from the people around us. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? From the examples. Like, I mean, Lyle Zalzado might not be the best example. Cause well, he, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we don't, uh, um, you know, like I didn't, Social media didn't exist. Right. So I didn't know who Lyle Ozeda was. Yeah. I just knew that he, he was, was a this, fucking stud, yeah. Yeah, this massive dude walking down the beach, and I knew I wanted yeah. to lift weights. But it's, uh, you know, for parents uh, uh, and just adults in your life in general. Well, when, um, I, uh, when I came home and told my dad mm -hmm. I wanted to lift weights, he laughed mm -hmm. at me and said, only stupid people lift weights. This is counting to 10 over and over again. Mm -hmm. And I remember telling him, no, Dad, I think this lifting weights thing is important. Mm -hmm. And he supported me with it. And said, you know what, I think it's stupid because he had never grown up lifting weights. Right. But I said it was important. And uh, I ended up training with an old power lifter in our neighborhood, mm -hmm. a guy named George Zangus. And my dad, I remember, dropped me off. He'd pick me up, take me, and he was super supportive of it. He didn't necessarily understand it, but he saw that it was important to me. But there was always one non-negotiable for us was the education piece. Sure, yeah. Um, so when I went to take my trip to Berkeley, uh, they asked me if I wanted to talk to anybody on the academic advisory team. And I mm -hmm. said, I'd love to talk to somebody at the law school. Yeah. So they had a guy named Adrian Cragen, who was a former dean of the law school, mm -hmm. Boltall. And uh, he was an old, old attorney, you know, had since retired. So they take me in to meet with him. And I ended up telling him my dad was an attorney, and he apprenticed under a guy named Kent Redwine. And they, he was both, uh, he was a Hollywood attorney as well, or he, at the time he was a Hollywood attorney, entertainment lawyer. And uh, actually, Adrian Cragen knew my dad's mentor. Mm -hmm. And so that was a kind of an interesting piece. And he puts his hand on me and he goes, I need you to do two things. One, I need to learn, I need you to learn to read and write to the best of your ability. 
because if you can't read and you can't write, you can't think. Right. People that think without writing are fools. So learn to read and write to the best of your ability. There's a major here at Berkeley called rhetoric, which mm -hmm. is kind of an interesting deal. People still crack jokes out I was a rhetoric major, but it was basically an English philosophy yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. writing major, mm -hmm. you know, English with like an argumentative approach. He mm -hmm. said, if you are a very skilled rhetorician, you'll do very, very well in uh, well, law, anything, law school. Well, really. I mean, to be honest, just being able to th to articulate viewpoints, uh, being able to steel man other people's arguments and shit like mm -hmm. that, you have to have a pretty good foundation with critical thinking and then expression to be able to do something like that, right? Well, yeah, and we had to read. It was like 25 to 30 books a semester. Yeah. And then the classes were very Socratic method, stand up, mm -hmm. debate both sides. And then he looked at me and he goes, and there's a four-year scholar, or there's a scholarship for a four-year letterman, undergraduate from Berkeley to go to Bolt. It's called the Adrian Cragen Scholarship. And he winked at me and he's like, I got pull. <laughs> on uh, on who gets it. Mm -hmm. So at that point, I knew, hey, uh, you know, and I and, and surprisingly, uh, I really loved school. Mm -hmm. um, I loved my major. I loved everything. I, well, about high it. school sucked, but once I started going to college, yeah. I went to about eight years of college, and once I got into college where it was where I was actually learning shit, then I really started to enjoy yeah. it. Like my GPA in high school, I think was like two point four something like that. My cumulative GPA over eight years of college is three nine seven. It is a difference, right? Like it just being engaged in shit. I didn't care about anything. Hi, high school uh, American public education sucks generally speaking, but especially high school. Yeah. It's I, I I think maybe we should adopt the German model where you're done in two or three years and then you go to a university or something. It's just a so much wasted yeah. time. You don't learn anything about uh economics or personal finance you don't learn any real practical skills like well, you. well you, you have to remember um so uh i graduated in four years with my mm -hmm. degree in rhetoric and then i had to enter into a one-year uh, master's program and right. they had one for education so i took the um what was it, the gre and got mm -hmm. into it and then i really got into and have a accurate assessment of how education was designed in the united states and it was heavily influenced by henry ford yeah uh, they wanted to create compliant workers factory yeah. workers yep. that could basically be plug and played in pieces mm -hmm. and they dumped a ton of money into the education system so you know rogue memorization what we were doing um isn't about critical thinking sure um that was why when we moved here to texas uh you know i sat down and i used to evaluate grant proposals for charter schools mm -hmm. when i was at uh, in college and you know you go talk to the teachers i looked at the curriculum we ended up putting our kids in a private school mm -hmm. because i wanted them to, to learn to read and write and think and be able to like critically think to the best of their ability, and that was not happening in a public school. No, it's never going to happen in a no. public school. And, and uh, that's a sad realization because our tax dollars go to it. Yeah. And, but at the end of the day, I don't have any oversight on the curriculum. Well, unless... Texas is getting ready to change that up soon. I think a bill, I think a school choice bill will be passed here with sometime this year and signed by the governor. So we'll see how that works out. It'd be excellent. Um, but yeah, it's you and I know how these. Uh, this structure, this, this uh, I guess, shoddy infrastructure uh, affects affluent and middle-class kids. Now, I, I, you, can, you can only imagine how it affects kids in poverty, mm -hmm. right? Because if the system sucks, it's going to suck worse for people that have less resources. Sure. That's just how it is. Well, they, they don't have the ability to pivot. Yeah. So and, how, uh, how, do you, how do you dig out of that? I mean, it, it's – I hear charter schools get called racist a lot. I'm like – no, this is like the best possible solution uh, yeah. for people that are underprivileged. Well, the problem, I always think sometimes the people that are making these decisions don't actually have a vested interest in the success of these individuals. No, they want, they, they just want to keep their jobs. Well, they want to keep their jobs, but there's this idea of, uh, you know, like let's drown the individual to allow the masses sure, to float. Yeah. And I really think we've, we've really moved away from what the fundamentals of this mm -hmm. thing are. That if you can critically think, and you can present somebody like a problem. Like part of the problem I run into in just present day life is I like to think that I can critically think mm -hmm. and I understand empathy. And more importantly, as a rhetoric major, I can argue both sides. And the secret to arguing both sides is understanding your opponent's argument on such a granular level that you can argue it for them. Right. And so anytime I hear something pushed against me, what I do is I investigate their argument so that I can basically, you know, parrot their argument. The problem I run into is for what's presently happening in the world, it's almost a bridge too far for me some days. Mm. And when things are a bridge too far and I can't actually have empathy and put myself in their argument, I realize that it's a straw man argument. It's a distraction. Sure, yeah. So, yeah. you know, I mean, uh, if you think, you know, whether it be 
um, you know, like everything from, you know, uh, different genders and so many of the things that are flooding the, the, uh, mm. uh, you know, the media and different social media deals. But I really think like, how many people does this really affect? Sure. And yeah. like, yeah. there's much more important problems in the world. Like, I feel like we're being distracted with minutia sure. because it's, uh, almost too much to grasp well, it's, when you look at the, at the grand scheme of what's happening. Sure. It's paralysis by analysis, right? Well, there's too many options. Well, so that way people can't actually do anything yeah well it, it's it's um, like a denial of service attack almost well it, it's like a shotgun approach mm -hmm. right like if you, you people can't focus because so much is thrown at them and they don't have the critical thinking ability sure. or the wherewithal or just the history or even the intellectual capacity to be able to like calm the noise and see what's most important right. and happening in the world well it's shiny objects i mean it's the it's the coliseum it's the roman mob yeah. right uh, I mean, that's, 100%. Th this is what it's been used by every government in history yeah. to to dampen the critical thing. Because look, nobody I mean, no nobody in power wants to rule over critical thinkers because then they have to tell the truth. They well, have to say, hey, this war we're fighting or this uh, uh, thing we're doing in the government, maybe it'll benefit some people, maybe it won't. But really, it's about my interests. You know well, what I mean? Uh, like you bring up the war in the Ukraine, we knew this was going to happen for twenty years. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, we, at least uh, at least since twenty fourteen. Yeah. I mean, when the, we overthrew the Ukrainian government. Well, right? we did. I mean, there was also it goes back to before that with the fall of the Berlin Wall, where we weren't right. supposed to put NATO bases east, and then <laughs> I mean, and what do you do? Yeah, and then all of a sudden, and what's Putin been saying for twenty years? Mm -hmm. Don't put NATO bases on our border, and what have we been doing? Put NATO bases on the border. And that, we also I, knew that if we blocked his access to a deep water, warm water port, yep. he doesn't have the ability to move any of their stuff. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, so not that that necessarily justifies any no. of it, but it's like you can't, you can't, you, you can't just say that uh, uh, we're blameless in all this. You no, know what I mean? That's not a critical way to think about. Well, you got to remember the U.S. government only uh, creates nothing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Our only export is war. So yep. what we have to do is we have to set up all of these situations to create conflict and war so we mm. can export what we do best, which is war. Sure, yeah. I mean, well, these days. War, I mean, well, since the 1950s, probably. Yeah. That's true, I mean, yeah. you know, uh, as you know, wars of occupation are about transfers of wealth. Right. So uh, when we go in and we get into a war like what we happened in, uh, um, in Afghanistan mm. and Iraq for 20 years, that's about – basically porting over tax dollars into private corporations. Yeah, and that's how they made billions. About $5 trillion per war. Yeah. And um, that's and, the transfers you know, of wealth. Yeah. It so just, you just, you're extracting wealth from the from American the people. American people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it it's basically transfers of wealth. We have these rich guys that mm -hmm. donate money. And what we're going to do is we're going to basically set this thing up so that we can port dollars. And what we do is under the guise of like America. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, yeah, liberty and freedom. We're yeah. going to bring it to them. But and then what do we do? We pull out after twenty years. We leave billions of dollars worth of equipment there, and the exact people we went in there to save them from, we abandon. Yeah, that's uh, that's fucking painful. It's not. It's for, not very American. But we did it to we did it to our own people as well with with the war on drugs, the yeah. war on poverty, or whatever you were talking earlier about um, before we started the show about your dad's opinion about the crime bill and things like that and how uh, yeah. we fucked over the black community yeah. as no, well, like nobody, I, I agree with this. I think nobody's had a bigger negative impact on the black community than Biden and the people that, yeah. including the black caucus, right. Well, who supported the crime bill. Let's take this a step back. Mm -hmm. So as I was telling you earlier, you know, my dad was a criminal defense attorney and uh, before that he was a probation officer and mm -hmm. a DA. And he was actually uh, a probie for Mookie Williams. Oh, really? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, he knew Mookie. Yeah. You know, who was the guy that started the Crips. Yep. And so uh, my dad, you know, uh, friends with uh, Johnny Cochran and Charlie mm -hmm. Lloyd and all these, you know, really interesting. I mean, was a, a fixture in, in LA sure, for yeah. years. Um, he told me at, at one point he went into court and they had been actually talking about getting rid of jails in California. They were so underpopulated that they were talking about doing out pay, like, uh, um, you know, halfway homes, kind of minimum security, sure, yeah. and they were going to shut them down. And then all mm. of a sudden, crack cocaine hit the street, and he made a joke one time that it was like a black cloud that went over L.A. Mm. and Southern California. And he walked in one day, and there was like 100 murders when there was none the day before. And it was like... Like it, it was like one of the movies where all of a sudden you see the time lapse and things just mm -hmm. deteriorate. You know, Compton, uh, Englewood, those were white middle class areas. Yeah. 
um, you know, that they grew up in. And then all of a sudden, like, they bring this stuff in, and he goes, and my dad made a joke. He's like, I never saw a black person go to Columbia and come back from this. Right, yeah. No, I mean, that, was know, the, uh, that was, was the CIA. CIA. Yeah, they brought it in. They, they were funding uh, wars in Iraq, Iran. No, they were funding, well, it was uh, the Iran-Contra deal. Yeah. So they were bringing it in. But they, we, So we were funding both sides of that war. Yeah, the U.S. government officially was funding Iraq, but the, we were also funding the Iranian-Contras yeah. mm-hmm. through drug money that we— they, yeah. It's well. I mean, you you look at uh, you know the history of the CIA with Venezuela oil oh, yeah, and all. Yeah. I mean, it's. it's super- I don't understand how anybody still takes any of these agencies, the FBI or CIA, seriously because well, all they do is fuck shit up. Yeah. Like literally everything they do, There's fuck a, shit up. Uh, and I, the biggest the biggest opportunity they ever had to to protect us was nine eleven, and they fucked that up too. So what the fuck are we paying these guys for? Yeah. Like if uh, it, if they were a contract agency. Yeah. Like if you hired them as your marketing team and Maybe they performed don't. as they have performed over the last sixty years, you'd be like, "Nah, we're good. Man, I, you just get the fuck uh, out of here." I did some contracting for the 18th Airborne Corps, and mm-hmm. uh, the general that brought us in. I remember we we had a really long talk, and actually the CIA came up and he actually gave me a book called "Legacy of Ashes." Oh yeah, which well, is a, that's a good book. History of the CIA, yep. all their fuck ups. Yep. So uh, <laughs> from but, from the Bay of Pigs oh. until present, actually before the Bay of Pigs yeah. even. Oh yeah, I mean, and then you know the the Bay of Pigs fails and all the other. We stuff. We were and fucked then, up in uh, and in then Vietnam and the. Too, yeah. Well, I mean, Kennedy was going to pull it out. I mm-hmm. mean, and uh, LBJ was a war hawk. I mean, so, I mean, there's a bunch of terrible shit, but uh, that crack cocaine thing hits in LA, it just completely changes. You know, and then what happened was with uh, the rise of the crime bill, mm. now all of a sudden they, uh, you know, Richard, mass incarceration. Well, it was Richard Nixon's war on drugs, where now sure, all of a sudden yeah. they made felonies out of this. Yep. And it did more to destroy the black community because it pulled all these fathers out and put them in. Right. So now all of a sudden these kids are fatherless, they bound together, and this is the basically the. Um, creation of the Crips and the Bloods and the LA gang culture. We associated um, because there was a, a violent element to the drug. Instead of trying to interdict that, we just tried to go to the drug itself. That this is the problem with Western culture that I see. We continuously try to solve problems downstream instead of upstream. We well, got to right? remember too, and we we also brought it up that uh, in California, uh, the jails and the prison system is basically supported through private entities. Now it is, yeah. yeah. Since the 1970s. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so the, these guys had contracts, and they yeah. have to keep a certain amount of people in prison right. to, for their contracts. So now they're exploding because it just was beneficial yeah. to put people in this deal. So it's um, it's a pretty shitty deal. It and is. Then, you, can, you can make the argument that as far as the, the – saturation of violence it makes sense to lock people up and shit like that if they're if they're fucking around in neighborhoods and and you know negatively affecting other people but yeah but we still have to solve the problem of the father's home at some point dude uh, and my dad always said he goes you know uh because you know he had an opportunity to not only work on both sides of Mm -hmm. this and he's like when you remove fathers from the home Mm -hmm. and you don't have a positive male figure for these individuals they're going to go out and search for it and they get it from the gangs sure and And it happens sometime uh so for we have about 200 years of data, crime data, and uh, the most common predictor of criminal activity used to be poverty, right? Mm-hmm. Up until the mid to late 1950s, and then it became fatherless homes. Yep. Uh, it was uh, kids who were coming of age whose parents died in World War II mm-hmm. or people who were involved in criminal activity throughout the uh, 40s and 50s, and now all of a sudden they're an adult man with no or a sixteen year old or to adult man well, with no it, fucking positive male role model and they're gonna do what they're gonna do, right? Well they're well so so the positive real uh, positive male role model is the key. They did a study where they found that fathers who had passed away, that like let's say they died in Vietnam as a mm-hmm. war hero, if the child was raised with their image of their father being a hero, mm-hmm. the kids grew up to be very successful mm-hmm. because they had something to adhere to. Right. When they came home and the mom was like, you know, your father's a piece of shit, you dealt drugs, he's in jail, right. then like that was the failure. So as long as the because they actually had a pretty interesting study, and I would have to pull this up and take some digging. Mm. But they had instances where mothers lied to the uh, to the children. Your father was an incredible war hero. He died in Vietnam mm. when the guy actually was a deadbeat and ran away. Mm. Uh, but the mothers didn't shit on them, and right. those kids grew up to be very successful because they had something to adhere to. They but had shitting on to dad is to. part of our culture now, right? Well, like if you watch any sitcom, it's about how dumb dad is, yeah. basically. And yeah. it, look, it's funny. Because dudes, no, we are we are kind of dummies. We do dumb shit all the time. But like it, uh, that can't be the uh, only uh, thing that happens. You know what I mean? Do like we? Homer Simpson. Yeah, no. And I, uh, and, and uh, what's it? What's it called? Uh, Family Bundy. Guy. Oh, uh, Bundy. Yeah, well, uh, Married with Children. Married with Children. Yeah. I mean, like all these fucking 
I can't think of uh, positive male role models in in TV and sitcom TV. Right. Uh, the the only one that I ever saw was in Will Smith's. Uh, oh yeah, Prince of Bel Air. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the dad. That's true. Yeah. Well, uh, Uncle, who, Uncle, who was uh, a successful lawyer. Yeah, yeah. Grew up, you know, Beverly Hills. Mm-hmm. Uh, I remember there was a pretty good one. Like my, my my favorite, and I, I watched that show because I liked it. Everybody watched it. Sure, yeah. But there was one where he gets hustled in pool, and then he shows oh, yeah, up, yeah. and he like fake city's yeah, good yeah. in pool, yeah. and then he's like sh- bust out Lucille, mm-hmm. and he's got like the mm-hmm. black, uh, um, you know, butler dude hands yeah, him yeah. his deal, and he just torches him. I always thought yeah. that was pretty good. Yeah, I did too. And, I, and you know what irritates? Well, there's a lot of things that irritate me about this whole conversation, but. Um, who is it, me? Am I? No, 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 no. I mean, uh, the conversation around race and stuff like that. It's like, yeah, we know what the statistics say, yeah. but I, I have lived around black and brown people my entire life. They're no more violent than anybody else. Well, I also circumstantially worked though with a, with a, you know quite a few, right? Well, with black people exclusively. <laughs> yeah, exclusively. I was almost, a, yeah. uh, I was a very small minority. Maybe on the line, but everybody else. <laughs> well, no, but I mean, for the most part, um, you know, if you think about like uh, I. I, I think it's hilarious now that uh, um, somehow height is like now this like great divider for like uh, you know guys that work for me are like constantly like you know short kings and like, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, like yeah, heights yeah, is great divider yeah. for women. I'm like yeah. so what you're saying is a six foot six uh, white professional athlete you know played in the NFL you know graduated from college all this other mm-hmm. stuff. I'm like I'm like I didn't I just kind of figured this is how it all is, but it's <laughs> uh, I don't know. I mean I I never really viewed race um you know obviously once you get in the nfl you realize you're a second class citizen for a lot of reasons sure yeah but um i never really thought about it in any way well if you think about it though you can look at the guy in compton today and the guy in rural west virginia on hooked on fucking percocet scamming the government all the time that's the same dude it's a nihilistic person that doesn't feel any value in society so yeah. they're just going to do what they're going to do you know what i mean and that's not that's like the the whole point of society is to is to allow the individual to thrive because they're thriving. When we all do better, we all do better. That's well, what it is. Uh, and what I hate people the forget is uh, character has no color. Right. Yeah. And right. I hate and, the idea that it's that living in the suburbs and being educated and, and successful and even wealthy is somehow a white trait. Yeah. Uh, what that's, Nonsense. Well, but uh, but now and you're people talking, get called like an uncle, like oh, you you, you moved. You're so talking like, what about the a fuck narrative. are you talking about? Um, and and yeah, you know the hard part too with a lot of the black community, and I think it's perpetuated by the uh, Reverend Al Sharptons mm. and the Jesse Jacksons Nonsense, and these individuals. Yeah. It's a crab bucket. You never heard any of this shit from Colin, but like people used to talk about Colin Powell it's like, oh, he speaks so well. Yeah, he's got a fucking PhD. What are you talking yeah. about? Yeah, and look, doesn't look, matter. His race has nothing to do with that. And look how much they hate. Uh, was it Thomas Sorrell? Oh yeah, so I yeah, mean, yeah, dude. They people do not like him. So uh, I. I was very fortunate whenever people ask me and they especially kind of like shrug their shoulders when Mm. I, you know, when they learned I went to Berkeley, I actually loved going to Berkeley and you would have too, because you you got to see both sides of it in Mm. real time. And it was amazing. And not only from like the professors and just the education piece, but I really viewed it as Daniel in the lion's den. Mm. Like if you really want to understand this from a granular level, enter into it. It's really easy to go over and live in an echo chamber, but like walk into this thing. I mean, I had a professor named Pedro Nogueira. I still remember this like it was yesterday. It was over 20 plus years ago or longer than that, 30 years ago. Uh, Pedro Nogueira, I had a class with him and uh, he's a pretty famous dude, but he walked in and I remember him, you know, just dispelling myths. Like uh, a guy was wearing a necklace with Africa and, you know, this and, you know, white man is the oppressor and the slave. And, And he just completely dispelled that myth when he said, you know, do you think that like when the ship showed up, they went out and captured people? Yeah, and the guy was right. like, well, and he never really thought about it. He goes, they were already in cages, mm. right? Uh, the other black tribes had gone out, the slave traders started, like they sold the neighboring tribe in cages and put them out on these boats. Right. So he's like, you know, there's a narrative that would that have been pushed upon us. He's like, what color do you think the first person that owned slaves in the United States was? Was black. Yeah. And he went through and dispelled all of these myths. And then after class, I remember uh, he walked over and he stopped me and he's like, I need you to do me a favor. Don't ever wear your football stuff. <laughs> yeah. And he's yeah. like, you wear glasses, go yeah. get some. Yeah. And he goes, I want you to dress nice. I want you to wear glasses. And I want you to try to assimilate. But the problem is, is that black athletes are going to be treated very different than white athletes. Mm. So assimilate into this thing and don't ever wear your college football shit. Okay. And uh, Pedro was great. Yeah. Um, I took a, um, some amazing classes with some very sharp individuals. Uh, you know, some perpetuated it, many didn't. And um, I really view if you want to be educated, 
you have to be able to learn both sides. It's sure. so comfortable to go into your echo chamber and be around people that are just like you, but that's not going to force you to grow in any way. No, you miss you miss half half of things because so when I see people like BLM or anybody else protesting and talking about um, uh, uh, what they now call underserved communities and shit like that, I, I strongly encourage people on a regular basis not to just be dismissive of people like that because mm -hmm. you disagree with, with their solution. Because that doesn't – just because you disagree with their solution doesn't mean there isn't a problem to be solved, right? Yeah, well, I mean, the other issue comes down to we've seen groups like BLM in the past. Mm -hmm. And really they're just basically looking at the problem and finding a way as a vehicle to build – To monetize money. it. Yeah, yeah to yeah, monetize yeah. it. You know, I mean, they, you know, I mean, you can go back and look through history at different people. Um, who was it? It was um, – God, um, uh, Booker T. Washington mm -hmm. talked about that there will always be – black people in the community that make a ton of money by constantly pointing out racism and basically making this the forefront. Malcolm X said the same thing. Malcolm X said yeah. the same thing. Yep. And, uh, you know, I was, uh, I was very fortunate to take a class, uh, Afro, I think it was African American film, 142 A and B. Mm. Uh, and I'm trying to remember Albert Johnson was a professor. He since passed away, but we watched all this Afro, uh, African American film. It was a lot of documentaries, a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And like Malcolm X was revolutionary. And that his hatred of, like, the establishment was, like, both black and white. Yeah. And it was like, you know, I mean, the CIA killed him. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a, it's a scary individual. But well, I, um, you know what it is? It's th that kind of stuff can only thrive if we allow it to. You know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. like Tinkerbell. The government is like Tinkerbell, politicians. 538 people in D.C. don't have the ability to control anything we do in a real way, right? Mm -hmm. Because ultimately, power comes down to the individual, the individual's ability to, to express it. And uh, we allow the state to have a monopoly on violence because of our cowardice and laziness. That's yeah. the only reason it exists. Well, I mean, this, this goes back to, to really the fundamentals when, we, uh, when you originally kicked me over some of the questions for us to discuss. I mean, I've always believed, and um, I mean, this goes back, like, I'll just give you an example. I took some, uh, some classes, and there was like basically some early writing and some early thinkers of uh, like the Constitution. Mm -hmm. You ever um, read? Uh, but, uh, so my favorite was John Locke. Yeah, love and, Locke. And so John Locke to me was uh, the social contract. The idea that as we are born into this country, we're born into a social contract. And the, the trick to the social contract is it has to be mutually beneficial. Right. The minute that it's no longer benefits one party, it becomes null and void. Sure. And uh, based upon the present state, I mean, the, the social contract has become null and void. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't grow up with guns. Uh, so, you know, my dad was an attorney, mm. saw gun violence, and we just weren't raised around guns. Mm. So it wasn't until I read Thomas Jefferson and really understood the function of the Second Amendment did I actually go and purchase guns. And it was one of my first purchases when I thought that to be a citizen who pays taxes and live in this country, I had to be proficient with firearms based upon, just like I, I had to understand what freedom of speech was right. and be sharp enough blade to actually be able to discuss and understand what people are saying. The second one, the right to bear arms, mm -hmm. right? So if I don't mm -hmm. exercise my right, I tend to use it. I always hate when people are, um, you know, uh, you know, like the uh, uh, freedom of speech. Well, I'm not saying anything bad, so I don't have to worry about it. Or uh, I don't have to worry about illegal search and seizure because mm -hmm. I haven't done anything illegal. Well, just because you haven't done or said anything doesn't mean that you're not exercising the right. Sure. So yeah. I felt by not owning weapons, then I was not necessarily being able to enter into this agreement and this social contract within the Second Amendment. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, I find it hard to believe that uh, the founders decided to make gun ownership and the right to self-protection the second thing and then you know, modern folks sometimes try to pass that off as the right to hunt or something. Yeah, it's weird. Like, that, there's nothing I mean, with deer hunting in there. Yeah, there's, I, I don't. Well, but uh, but here's another it's issue. Very bizarre. Too, right? Like, so, so this is another thing that we have to take a step back from. Think about our founding fathers, mm. right? The founding, they, these guys got on boats, left, came to the, you know, uh, uh, America, which was like effectively the wilderness with mm. nothing with their own two hands. Talk about like, 
absolute settlers, pull yourself out of your bootstraps. I mean, death, famine, starvation, all of these things, like the most capable people. And when you look at the ages of our founding fathers, like, uh, I, like other than John Adams and, and Washington uh, oh, and Ben Franklin and Franklin, they were, were all, all like in 24 their 24 years old. Yeah. Yeah. They were all yeah. in their twenties. So like, I think just because of the white wigs and the pictures, I always yeah, thought of them yeah. as like older men, but they weren't, no. they, they were people younger than mm-hmm. us. Um, you know, we would be considered uh, elder statesmen in that yeah, group. Yeah. But one thing was these individuals were uh, highly motivated, extremely resourceful, and had a knack for survival. So with that said, there was a certain level of proficiency and expectation that if you were a piece of shit or lazy or un- or, or not proficient with anything, mm. you would have died. Sure, yeah. So now yeah. we live in a society where, like, you know, you don't have to be proficient. So I think our founding fathers, even though I believe that they had incredible vision, um, I mean, amazing vision for them to basically tell us that there's a few things you need to avoid, mm. a centralized banking system and a standing army, Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, those two things, they, they talked about the, mm. the best thing to avoid. You never want a standing army. Other than army. Hamilton. Hamilton pushed for both of those things, but he yeah. was the only guy. He was the only really, one. Yeah. I mean, Thomas Jefferson spoke. <laughs> like, if you want to destroy America, have a standing army and yeah. a centralized bank. Yeah. And these are the two things you've had. But the one thing I think is these individuals were so, I mean, think about uh, fighting the the British and this, uh, you know, I mean, people always talk about the Second Amendment. What's the Third Amendment? Mm. You know, you're not, you're not forced to house military in the house, mm. right? Because they had to house the British. But these individuals were highly motivated and extremely resourceful. But, uh, but so in their because minds, they had to be because they had to be right. because it, it yeah. was necessitated. It now I think when they write the Constitution, they don't realize that like and I'll just give you an, uh, a deal. I went to go uh, my concealed weapons class. Um, I had a CCR or a CCW in mm-hmm. California. Uh, one of the guys that was in the qual um, effectively had zero experience with guns um, and basically uh, had a misfire, mm. turned and aimed the gun at the uh, uh, RO. The guy, like, two-hand jacked him into, like, you know, like the standard deal. Sure, yeah. Uh, the gun went off, and, like, the old man was laying on the ground, and, like, I realized, like, one, people don't train. Yeah. They're not in good shape. They're not proficient with weapons, so we've granted people a right, but there needs to be other pieces in there. Like, you need to be physically able to do this. You need to have sure, a basic yeah. intelligence test and competency. Well, I mean, because they, I think that they just expected, because everybody yeah, around them was yeah. fairly fucking, yeah. like, all their shit was in one sock, to quote Dave Brewer, uh, but everybody was very well sorted and, and fucking on it. Yeah. You know, and now you bring in a bunch of people that are closer to house cats and just mm-hmm. fucking, you're going to have to cut them out of your house because they're in yeah. 600 pound life. Yeah. And you- it's we're dealing with this dichotomy where we've we do feel a sense of generalized and also direct empathy for other people it's it's difficult to watch somebody struggle up close especially right yeah. um and it makes you feel some kind of way when you're comfortable and other people aren't and that's good because that's our social nature you have two hands for a reason one to pull yourself up one to pull the next guy up with you sure. but we're not doing anybody any favors by removing the difficulty out of life or yep. removing the rites of passage out of life and things like that. Because this is, this is the iron that sharpens us as human beings. Yeah. Iron you know sharpens I mean? iron is one man sharpens the other. It's mm. in the Bible. I mean, I, I was actually laughing the other day that, uh, uh, you know, the huge thing on social media now is, uh, cold plunges oh, boy, yeah. that somehow this builds massive resiliency <laughs> and that this getting into cold water for two or three minutes might be the hardest thing you've ever done. It's when just I hear that, microwave. I uh, like want to huck myself off a cliff. <laughs> so I mean, uh, um, like the amount of you know, I I wasn't in the military, so mm. I don't you know claim that piece. But you know, playing in the NFL was extremely difficult. I played with broken fingers, broken legs, mm-hmm. played at a high level, and uh, we have constantly always pushed ourselves, uh, you know, as far as we can. Sure, yeah. And uh, I think that if the hardest thing you do in your life is getting into cold water for two or three minutes. We probably need to like readjust and unfuck your life. Yeah, I mean, maybe, I n- not that there aren't benefits to that sort of thing, but the benefits I think are physiological and not mental, frankly. Well, I mean, but but people talk about like this builds resiliency and this will make you mentally tough, and I'm like, dude, we used to go surfing in that water. Yeah, you know, I mean, like I dude, I got in a cold tub every single day in the NFL. Uh, <laughs> like we've gone swimming in yeah, like yeah. For, fucking forty, fifty degree water. Like I don't, I don't shiver, and it's not cold. 
Like, I mean, it's cold, but like, I don't view that as like some like badge of toughness. Right. You know, it's kind of like people go to the gym and they like, I'm killing it and this and this. I'm like, dude, you're lifting weights. Yeah. It's not like you're in Afghanistan kicking in doors or, you know, fucking on the front line of the Ukraine, Mm -hmm. you know, rolling out. So, I mean, it's not a horrible idea to put your, I mean, we, we do this now though. I, I, we were talking about it on, uh, drinker bros the other day, um, about what people are choosing as their hobbies. Now they're choosing hobbies based on things that used to be necessary to stay alive. Yeah. Right. Which is interesting because why, I mean, if you think about the, the mental process, why would we go back to things we've left behind through progress? And it's because those things are essential to life. Right. I mean, that's, it's, it's purpose. That's we're we're organisms. We're machines that are designed to do a certain thing. And well, that thing uh, is, you know, stay alive. I think, um, uh, so I'm a, collector of I guess you could say um, skills like mm-hmm. I'm a skill collector uh, when we first decided to move to Texas uh, we bought a big piece of land and I've learned to run everything from heavy equipment I weld and fabricate and I can fix anything and but these are skills that I've developed by actually doing it sure yeah. um, you know I build off-road trucks and I can TIG and MIG and uh, you know I mean I, I got a, a track loader full forestry mulcher I manage mm-hmm. all of our own stuff I mean I, you know everything I can do. Yeah. And I learned these skills by actually forcing myself to do these things. Um, I like to believe that if you put me into a situation, whether it be, uh, fucking blind stupidity, uh, talent, or just an unwilling ability to execute, I can fucking do anything. And I think people with that mindset are the ones that built this country and really forged a path. Uh, I don't really think that like the idea of like self doubt and weakness existed. No, and, no, no. Um, I mean, you just, it's, you get the job done. Yeah. Whatever it takes, you just get, yeah. that's why like for and, startup companies, especially, but for any company, but for startups, especially hiring veterans is a good idea because the, the, the I, I can't doesn't exist yeah. because you've just been, you've been conditioned. It's not about if you take one person and put them through all this stuff and one person and you don't put them through all this stuff, they could be genetically identical and you're going to get vastly different results. Yeah. It's, it has nothing to do with the intrinsic nature of a certain person. It is just the work that you do, right? Or, you know, I I don't like hiring people that didn't play on team sports. So um, I really think it's important. And I I actually look at the U.S. military, and especially Mm. the guys that served, as playing on the biggest team. Yeah. Because you have to work in small groups. You have to learn. And, like, everybody sucks. Everybody's great. Mm. And I think you learn uh, how to work with other people and how to manage expectations. And more importantly, like, work as a team. And, uh, you know, either somebody served in the military or they had to play team sports. Because we've hired people that haven't. And we've also hired people that were uh, individual athletes mm. and not nearly as, as good. Or sure. the other one, too, is uh, I was the youngest of three brothers. I usually look for people that were like the, the youngest kid or actually grew up with some older brothers. Mm. They just tend to have a, a different chip on their shoulder. Sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, Have you ever you, – you talked about Locke before. Have you ever read The Perceptor? Do you know what that is? Mm-mm. So it is by Robert Dodsley. It was a, a university textbook on – liberty and government and the rights of man basically and well, it, it was published i think in 1750s uh john locke was uh, life liberty and property yep and then we adjusted it to the, the right pursuit of me. happiness yeah which yeah. is a fascinating deal like life i have the ability or i i have and and this is wild too uh, the government doesn't grant us shit no uh, the government extracts wealth from the well, population uh, That's all they do. And, and what's wild is that people think that the government somehow grants us rights which <laughs> yeah, yeah. it doesn't exist like this. Yeah. Like, like look at the ATF. That would be a privilege, by the well, way. If somebody the, can grant it to you, that's a privilege. That's a privilege. It's not a right. Yeah. Not a right. So look at the ATF and this uh, uh, um, arm brace deal, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. which to me uh, yeah. looks like um, a violation of the Civil Dif- or the Disabilities Act. ADA. You yeah. know, yeah, yeah. Look at Crispy. He can't, f- I mean, you know, he's got, he's missing fingers in this. Mm-hmm. I mean, to stabilize, he needs that. So yeah. now you're basically taking away his Second Amendment rights yeah. because of some arbitrary thing after, what, 40 of the million of those things have been sold, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. But here's the deal. Uh, the government doesn't grant me rights. Those are mm-hmm. privileges, right, if they grant me. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, you know, God or whoever you think, um, you know, whoever your imaginary friend in the sky, I always joke that uh, people arguing about religions, like arguing who's got the best imaginary friend, <laughs> yeah, like yeah, whoever you want to yeah. buy into. But right. That individual that sits above, uh, you know, that's maybe the father of creation, however you mm. look at it, those, ra- those rights are granted to me by sure. God, not by or, the government. Or the natural laws of the universe, but yeah. it's not some fucking government. Yeah, I mean, so like I, I have the right to live a life mm. that I'm happy with. I think it's really important for us, uh, especially 
in the modern age, but this, this really should have started back in the 1950s and 60s to separate the idea of government from the idea of patriotism, right? Because yeah. it's not the same thing. Uh, being patriotic doesn't mean supporting the president. Because yeah. how, how could that be possible? It, well, it, it, it would be possible to say that if the president was acting in the best interest of the country. But that's a big if, right? Because that doesn't happen very no. frequently. And, and, I, and I really think today, uh, and this is really just the advent of social media, mm. uh, we have more optic on what's happening in the U.S. government than what we've ever had. And, and this less is, trust in the U.S. government well, than we've it, ever it's, had. Well, it's yeah. because, uh, like, now there's 24-hour, sure. um, you know, C-SPAN. You know, that that didn't exist. I mean, think of the optics we have. And I really think it, it uh, you know, it started with Obama. Mm. And you, you know what's one thing that always kind of struck me with Obama? Uh, nobody ever talked about Obama's connection to this whole thing. Right. We just thought he was this, you know, civil rights guy, this, uh, you know, the Chicago mm -hmm. small town, you know, guy. Kind of, no, dude. I mean, Lolo Satoro. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. his stepfather. Yeah. I mean, was, you know, ran, you know, death camps in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's pictures of him and and uh, young Brock that are standing there with uh, George W. Yeah. I mean, uh, sorry, George H. George H. Yeah. And, um, you know, who, you know, like when uh, who was it? Uh, JFK Jr. Uh, started his magazine, George. They asked him why he named it George. He said he named it after the man who killed his father. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then he died in a plane yeah. crack. I mean, I mean, yeah. there's a lot of crazy shit. But like, you know, I mean, he was highly connected and his father to the CIA. I mean, basically, the guy was a, a CIA operative around death camps in Indonesia and was an absolute fucking hammer for the CIA for years. Yeah. And this is and like nobody ever talked about Lolo Satoro and the connection with mm -hmm. Obama and how he came in. Like, get the fuck out of here. Uh, and not not just that, but also the uh, Weather Underground terrorist groups yeah. that he was associated with. It's kind of weird. Right? Super it's weird. like I don't I don't believe any of the born in Kenya bullshit because there's no evidence. No. But was he groomed? Fuck yeah, he yes, was. of course he was. I mean, it's American politics, man. Of Come course. on, the only guy that hasn't been groomed that's made was, it into a higher office is fucking Trump. Trump. Was Trump, and that's just because he's rich. Well, and uh, um, <sighs> Trump to me is a hell of a conundrum. Yeah. And I, uh, he'd be great I, if you'd shut the fuck up. Well, they should have taken social media from him. <laughs> yes. And just do me a favor let somebody who has some fucking style cut his hair <laughs> and fix the ridiculous suits. I think it might be too the, late for that. The at this overly point. long tie. I mean, the guy's wearing expensive suits that are ill fitting. Yeah. Tailor a fucking suit, wear a normal tie, and stop getting a spray tan and, and get rid of the yeah. fucking ridiculous hair. Yeah. If he just stopped looking like a Martian. Like a cartoon character. Like a cartoon yeah. character, he'd be fine. And then take his social media. <laughs> yeah. I mean, tweeting at the toilet at 2 in the morning trying to fight everybody isn't presidential. No. Think about Bill Ken or uh, I'm sorry, not Bill, um, George Clinton. Uh, no, George Clinton. Bill, Bill Clinton, Clinton, yeah. Yeah, so I'm thinking, thinking uh, Funk Parl Parlodemic. Um, Bill Clinton, uh, I... So I was super fortunate when we were doing a bunch of contracting mm. stuff. We got invited to do uh, the West Wing tour. Mm. And as you walk into the Oval Office, you realize there's no corner in the Oval Office. Right. Fucking old, old uh, uh, Bill Clinton got fucking nice headpiece yeah. at the Resolute desk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, because they always joke like, where'd this happen? Over in the corner. There is no corner. Yeah, yeah. So... Uh, you know, like that guy got up and they asked him, do you ever have sexual relations? And he said, no. Mm -hmm. And then they brought out the dress and he fucking completely reversed. I mean, that yeah, guy yeah, didn't even yeah. sociopath. Mm -hmm. But I think with Trump, if they could have just managed him a little bit mm -hmm. better and been a little more presidential. Uh, the problem, though, is he was, uh, you know, a lone snake in a viper pit. Yeah. yeah uh, all yeah. the people that were the people around constantly him. Constantly under attack. Yeah. yeah. I mean, constantly under attack. And the people that were his advisors were already undermining. Look at... Um, What's the uh, Millie, General Millie? Oh, yeah. I mean, the, um, and now they've come out and they're yeah. like, there was a bunch of information we didn't give them. Which at yeah, the end of the yeah. day, I'm like, isn't that treason? Seems like it. Like, uh, if yeah. you are withholding necessary information from the commander in chief, yeah. literally the head of this thing, that feels like treason to me. And nothing is proud of that. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, but that, that tells you everything you need to know about the American government. It's not about providing a service to the American people. It's just an aristocracy. It's what Washington specifically was trying to avoid. Yes. Like John Adams and uh, and Alexander Hamilton wanted to come up with honorific titles. They wanted to make people. a king. Yeah. And, uh, and Washington rejected it. Yeah. I think people ask me who my, like I hate politicians generally, but people ask me who my favorite president was. It would be Washington because he served two terms. And after that, he intentionally uh, yeah. stopped 
to well, they set wanted the to precedent. make him the king, and yeah. he said, "No, I, I, yeah. I serve my time. I get to go on and move on." And then everybody after him followed suit until FDR. Yeah, honestly, I mean, John Adams just didn't win re-election, but he was old as shit anyways. But yeah. everybody following bowed out after two terms. Yeah, um, and you know that's well, probably a good thing. Well, I mean, think about this, right? Uh, um, I think. If you look at some of the stuff that JFK did, now JFK was a scumbag. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we when I did the West Wing tour, they take us out and they show you the uh, Rose Garden. Mm. Uh, the Rose Garden was created by Jackie O, who uh, JFK went away and mm. she demoed the pool and turned it into the Rose Garden because every day from eleven to one o'clock, he would go to the pool and have um, you know, basically uh, orgies with his press secretaries that were really hookers that he brought in. So we heard this from the guy who gave the West Wing tour. He's mm. like, this was created because JFK would basically hire these hookers to be mm. his press secretaries, and they would find young uh, young girls to be their interns. And he'd go every day at the pool from 11 to 1 and have orgies. He left, and, J- and Jackie O just got rid of the pool. <laughs> I mean, that's one way to do it. Uh, I, guess, I right? mean, complete savage. Yeah. Um, yeah, we just don't see... Anytime any anybody's trying to barter me for um, my cooperation, I become immediately and deeply suspicious of that mm. person. Right? Do like, you, do you I, get approached from a lot of people trying to trying to gather your support? Oh yeah, yeah. Interesting. Um, and so so I, I I've uh, uh, I've always heard like uh, uh, numerous people I've always talked about you know the secret organizations Illuminati mm-hmm. that there's always this like I've never been approached by any of these people. It's not it's not I, I think people bec- because there's such a large group of people who are all on the same they're all doing the same grift right they're all just trying to get it's all snake oil and they're just trying to get a piece of it. So they act similarly. I don't think there's necessarily always collusion between them. I think it's the wink and the nod. Like, hey, we're all here to, like, these are all the peasants. So that doesn't have to be a formal group of people doing this shit. It's just any asshole that's in power is going to try to do it. So uh, all, all you have to do is go back and listen to George Carlin. So one of my f- saddest moments. It's a big moments, club and you ain't in it. Yeah, it's yeah. a big fucking club and you ain't in it. But yeah. George Carlin was uh, called this shit out years ago. Mm-hmm. And, you know, one of my greatest, there were, there were a few things that I, I was sad to see. I wasn't, I was sad to see George Carlin pass before Trump mm-hmm. came in. And, that would have uh, been interesting. Uh, and I, and actually, um, John Stewart. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like uh, go back and forth with John Stewart. But at the end of the day, uh, his daily show was an absolute, fucking rocket ship yeah. and was like a lightning bolt for politics. And he was so, I mean, uh, Trevor Noah has just completely uh, like abortion to that. Well, they're terminating thing. the show now. What's that? Oh yeah. they It's over after this. Well, year. they had to, do you yeah. know why? Cause uh, the one thing that John Stewart was, he wasn't a company man Yeah, and yeah, he was going to yeah. come out and say it. And they just basically simulated Trevor mm-hmm. Noah to be, uh, you know, push his, whatever narrative they wanted. They dropped so, two under 300,000. Uh, well, as uh, as they should, so. be, because Trevor Noah was just like, I, I used the term. It was, it was awful. Yeah, he's and uh, John Stewart, like uh, that whole deal with the, um, with the nine 11, where they were mm-hmm. screwing over all the first responders and he went and spoke like, He's a fucking sharp dude, man, and yeah. a passionate dude who mm-hmm. retired and took that as his mantle. And uh, yeah, so George Carlin and him, I think you, I, I think you're always going to have to have, and this is the problem with the media. The media has just become another branch of the government. Sure. You yeah. know, uh, what was it? Uh, um, Operation Mockingbird, yep. you know, what they say doesn't mm-hmm. exist, but of course it still does, where the CIA mm-hmm. went in and basically got dirt on all these, mm-hmm. all these reporters. You know, just like Operation Paperclip that they tried to deny where we brought over Nazi scientists and let them run wild. I mean, dude, the, the U.S. government's extremely shady. And the problem is all this stuff has been kicked out with the FOIA requests, and yet people don't seem bothered by any of it. I, I think people are bothered. I think they don't want to surrender the convenience of daily life to take a stand against it. That's my opinion. Mm. I, I think so. Ben Franklin used to warn about trading uh, your rights for security. Mm-hmm. Um, But what he didn't conceive of, and it's a point you were kind of making earlier, I don't think the founders could ever conceive of people being this stupid or lazy. But what he he didn't conceive of was people surrendering their rights for convenience. So there's a – I I took a bunch of notes, but, like, there's an old saying that you don't know how big a tree is until you cut it down. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's a human tendency not to value something until it's under assault or lost. Right. And I, I think you get to a certain point, and um, I've always, like, like I remember when I read that quote, 
it was hard for me because I've gone and stand at the base of the Redwoods. Mm. You know, anybody that's never seen the giant sequoias have been to California and seen the Redwoods yeah. and seen the magnitude of those, like you feel tiny. Mm -hmm. And when I read that quote, I realized that most people have never seen it and probably don't give a shit. Right. And so um, this is wild. As my dad got older, um, his political views started aligning with things that were very personal to him. Mm -hmm. And one of those was uh, protecting nature mm -hmm. and, and America. That he thought that like, uh, you know, the redwoods and like with like the, um, um, what is it, like the Sierra Conservation mm -hmm. and that, like those things that he remembered as a kid and as a Boy Scout, my dad was an Eagle Scout, uh, were super important to him and almost like, fo like focused his voting. And I think as people age, certain things become very, very polarizing. Mm -hmm. And the one thing I forever strive against is this, this idea of like what I call crystallization and the avoidance of neuroplasticity. Mm -hmm. So I think as men age, and you can kind of see this and you guys will laugh as you're, as you're watching this, you can take looks at pictures of men and you can go back and let's say you were to take a picture every year and go back, you can effectively look at the exact point to when they crystallize because the haircut never changes. Mm -hmm. So men at about age, late 20s, early 30s, mm -hmm. they get one haircut, and they rock that haircut for the next 40 years of their life, and that's when the shit crystallizes. They no longer, you know, they dress the same, mm -hmm. they have the same friends that they've had, they like the same car, they do these things, and they're very um, not good at pushing themselves out and being a white belt and, you know, meeting new people, having new discussions, entertaining new ideas, entering new circles so that you can be forced to think outside the box. Do you think they're not good at it, or they just don't see a purpose in it? Well, I think they crystallize. Mm. And the uh, the growth mindset ends, mm. and they just become curmudgeons. And we see this with old men. Like, and I really think is if you're constantly striving to learn new skills, meet mm. new people, and increase your circles, and tackle new tasks, I think you can avoid this neuroplasticity, or you can avoid the crystallization neuroplasticity. Like, uh, you know, I'm in this constant acquiring of new skills, mm. and as long as I can be a white belt and be a beginner, and I can go from uh, this uninformed unskilled individual mm -hmm. to informed and skilled, then I look at personal growth and it's time to assess something yeah, yeah. new. James Altucher talks about this a lot. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He's an author. Um, but he, what he does, his methodology for combating that is every morning when he wakes up, he makes a list of 10 things, whatever it is. It doesn't matter. Like 10 movies I liked or 10 things I want to accomplish by the time I'm 70 or whatever the fuck, right? Mm -hmm. Every day he makes a list of 10 things. Um, just to... Think about something new every day, I guess, right? I mean, and his goal, we've had him on the show to discuss it. His goal is basically the same, to prevent what you call crystallization. I don't know if that's a, a, a formal uh, term or not, but I it just makes call, sense. Yeah, I just call it crystallization. But, um, you know, there's a few ways. One, um, uh, you know, we can get into the physiology mm -hmm. of it. Uh, if you were to take two twins, for example, mm -hmm. um, and one was 10% body fat and one was 30% body fat, by the time they're four, 50 years old, the one that was 10% body fat is probably going to have a chronological age of 40, 42. Right. The one that was 30 at the age of 50 is going to be 65 in age. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, fat's extremely oxidative, right? Muscle's extremely insulin sensitive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you lift weights and you train, it's by far the greatest form of, you know, uh, of both longevity, youth, and staying healthy is by lifting weights and training and exercising. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you eat a pretty solid diet and you can keep your body fat relatively low, you know, create a large aerobic base. As we mm -hmm. age, we lose mitochondrial density and the ability to recruit motor units. Right. So if you can stay real strong and pretty fucking fit and you can go out and learn new tasks and actually uh, not only read, I mean, I still go back to this. If you don't read, you don't learn to think. Right. Yeah. Right. No, no, I, Which I mean, is what, this, that's, that's what makes assaults on language censorship well, so nefarious. So right? it's, uh, I mean, Adrian Cragen told me this fucking many years ago. He said, you learn that you need to learn and write to the best of your ability. Cause if you don't read, you will not learn to think, right? If you don't write, you won't learn to think. And so sitting down, reading and writing, that's how you formulate your thoughts. I encounter people constantly that don't read and don't write. And when I hear them speak, it's like nails on the chalkboard. Right, it's, yeah. There's not a coherent argument, mm -hmm. and all they do is they parrot somebody else. Sure. And I, I hear it all the time. I'm like, oh, you went to the weekend Andy Frisella, I'm going to tell you how it is seminar. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, or uh, or like you just listened to Joe Rogan, and so now you're a tinfoil hat guy yeah. who does this. I mean, you But can, do you think that Joe and Andy uh, listen to other people and then just regurgitate? Like, it, why 100%. Like, 
if you're trying to if you're trying to mirror one of those guys, do the work because that's what they did. Well, right? uh, yeah, and they you know it's been polarizing. I mean, uh, Joe's been very fortunate in that he's had the smartest people in the world sit at his desk mm-hmm. and have conversation with with him. And surprisingly, the American public has bought in because of his honesty of him right. going like, "Whoa!" Yeah, like I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. That sounds cool. Well, yeah, and he's you like, know? "This is fucking amazing." Yeah, and I think he that everybody can see themselves in Joe because he's not an elitist, mm-hmm. even though he might be. I don't know him personally. But he sits there and he feels very personable and he answers these questions a lot like uh, uh, like with the curiosity of a child. Mm-hmm. You know, like my kids ask me questions. Joe asks questions and I think the honesty is what attracts people. I think the dishonesty of politicians fucking makes people sprint and run. Yeah. And, and it, you know, it's the, the idea of thinking for yourself now. You got to trust the science. That's a big thing. But... What you're talking about with the this, uh, the with, trust of science has almost become a punchline. Oh yeah, because I mean, uh, they tried to make it into a religion, and well, I mean, forty percent of the country kind of bought into it, unfortunately. But. Well, um, I've always thought that uh, when I see everybody, so th- this is a classic one for me. The minute I see everybody running in this direction and the dumbest people I know with a, with a narrative, I usually run in the other yeah, direction. or at least stand still. Well, uh, right? <laughs> so uh, Greg Glassman. So mm-hmm. when I retired from the NFL, I got headhunted to work for CrossFit, and Greg asked me to come on and basically mm. create my own version of CrossFit, which was called CrossFit Football, which was a sports-specific version. And he asked me to go out to the world and try to see if we could basically educate CrossFitters on how to train athletes. Mm. Um, he made a really interesting – we were sitting there one night, and uh, he was telling me about his father, and he grew up – I think his dad might have been an alcoholic. But he was a super sharp dude, um, uh, you know, scientist. And he told me the difference between him and everybody else is that every time he hears something, he goes into with apprehension with this is bullshit. Mm. And he goes, if you just take the scientific method that everything is wrong, uh, everything is bullshit, nothing is true, and then everything, every step forward is proving it, opposed from believing everything, and then you know seeing the curtains fall down when you find out it's not true. He goes, you'll be a lot farther. Sure. So I kind of thought, I was like, you know what, maybe if I just approach everything as, eh, it seems like bullshit, and then work backwards. Uh, I think that has been by far one of the uh, greatest tips for, you know, querying out and figuring out what's bullshit and what's not. I mean, that's the root of epistemology, right? Like, it, we... we it's it's very problematic. Look, you don't want to be a dick about everything, but you need to be critical. Because... But we have confirmation bias. Sure, yeah. And, and, I, and it, it happens to me all the time. Mm-hmm. I hear something that I want to be right and sounds right, but I know that if I just buy in based on my confirmation bias, mm-hmm. I'm going to be behind the curve. That's a piece of advice I give a lot of people. The more you want to believe something, the more suspicious of that thing you should uh, 100%. be. hundred percent. Right? And if you just take the approach of, this seems like bullshit, mm-hmm. now let me work forward, I think you get a lot farther. The other... Yeah. Uh, a tip that I got from Greg Glassman, which I use constantly, which really explains a lot of this shit, mm-hmm. is people fail at the margins of their experience. People fail at the margins of their experience. So constantly when I run into people and they're pitching me things, I look at their experience and mm-hmm. how far they've gone. Like I'll just give you a classic example. People talking to me about football. Mm-hmm. And I hear people, uh, like all the time, people have these opinions on football, and I realize that their experience playing football is so diminished compared to mine mm-hmm. that they don't – I just look at them and be like, they're failing at the margins of their experience. Sure, yeah. My margin is much deeper. Mm-hmm. Um, so my eternal desire is to constantly be pushing my margin as far as I can because if I fall, f- fail at the margin of my experience, the longer I extend my margin, mm-hmm. then when my failure will be much farther. Sure, and it'll also be mitigated, yeah. right? Um, yeah, I think th- w- this is a thing that's become a big problem with personal health since – the 1950s, right, when the, the government started getting involved and in telling us what was good for us and not, which is they were wrong about literally everything. Everything. But, uh, you know, what you were talking about before about— 1959, uh, it's Ansel Keys, yeah. the seven-country study Eat where they— 12 vil- fucking servings of bread a day. Well, like, when they vilified me? saturated fat as <laughs> yeah. a relation for heart disease and not elevated carbohydrates and triglycerides. Yeah. I mean, they didn't even consider inflammation as the cause of all this stuff. Well, six months after that Ansel Keys deal came out, Mm. they basically disproved it. (laughs) Nobody told them. And we built a trillion dollar industry on the statins. (laughs) And you know what? Like if, uh, you know, this idea of high cholesterol Mm. and statins, um, the myelin sheath. So so Mm. the insulation for every nerve impulse Mm. and every nerve in our body is within this deal called myelin, uh, myelination, um, composed of cholesterol. When you all of a sudden start taking drugs that lower this, mm-hmm. now all of a sudden you're like, does this seem like it makes sense? Yeah. You know, our bodies produce more cholesterol on a single day than we could ever eat. 
Right. Yeah. Right. So yeah. like, yeah. this is a weird deal. And like Chris Masterjohn had a great uh, talk at the Ancestral Health Symposium where he talked about triglycerides and lipoproteins and mm-hmm. all this. And, um, you know, and this is, should be mainstream, but the problem is this doesn't fit within the narrative, no. but yet we Well, it doesn't fit within the narrative of Mars industry that's selling candy and shit like that yeah. and cereal to kids because that we spent the 1950s demonizing fat um, and, you know, doctors were saying what the healthiest cigarette was, which is kind of weird, uh, yeah. I guess. I mean, I, we, we knew that it wasn't good for you even then, I think. Yeah. But look at the results of that. Not just the people who are like generations deep addictive to sugar at this point, yeah. but also this is basic biology. If you, whatever food you eat, if there's not fat, if there aren't lipids inside of that, none of those nutrients are getting into your fucking body. Well, you know I mean, what I mean? That's why we there's have- There's one essential nutrient. Essential fatty acids. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, like, yeah. so I'll just give people listening at home. If you want to be, like, in the best shape, you eat a high-protein diet and caloric mm-hmm. restriction. It's how every single bodybuilder on the planet's yep. got in shape, right? Eat a high-protein diet and caloric restriction, mm-hmm. and you get jacked as fuck. Sure. Uh, it's how I was able to be, you know, 300-plus pounds and carry, you know, 280 pounds of lean body mass. Mm-hmm. It's by eating a shit ton of protein and staying enough in caloric restriction yeah. where I didn't get fat. You know, and I, I still lift weights. I bang. Sure. I train. Um, you know, we've been. Uh, I, I got approached to work with these um, professional Brazilian jiu-jitsu guys. Mm. So uh, Shandi Habero and mm. uh, uh, Victor Hugo and those guys from Six Blades. So I've been working with those dudes, and I went. I don't, now I've been rolling with them, and you know, still pretty proficient at all these things mm. because I fucking lift weights and train, and we do this shit every yeah. day. So I mean, I think the problem is, is the day that. You know, you stop becoming useful, you become useless. Yeah. And uh, as long as you're looking in this idea of like, I'm constant skill acquisition, I have to keep mm. sharpening my blade every single day, whether it be mentally, emotionally, physically, mm. within skill development, you're going to keep progressing. Yeah. The problem is people are fucking lazy. Lazy and stupid. Yeah. But I, I, lazy and scared maybe more than stupid. Yeah. But um, like there's, they feel like there's a, uh, and I feel like there's an informational barrier to entry because you, you were talking earlier about, neuroplasticity and, and physiological stuff, just the concept generally of iron sharpening iron. The reason you get old is because your cells uh, uh, break down over time, right? Yeah. They lose their ability to replicate over time. Yeah. Now, you can treat that to some degree with NAD, and, mm-hmm. and you can treat some of the soft tissue stuff with like collagen supplements and shit, mm-hmm. but the best way to train it is to have your body in constant motion. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, that. well, the only way to truly treat it, because these other things will, will stop working after a while. Yeah. No, I mean, you. Uh, if you stop training, um, you know, people go, you know, the age old, like, you don't stop lifting weights because you get old. You get old because mm. you stop lifting weights and training. Like, um, you know, and like, you know, uh, I train every morning, mm. uh, 6 a.m. Um, I still get up. It's part of my deal. And, uh, you know, I, I have a buddy system. So I got a guy that comes and trains with me. And people, like, constantly, like, there's you, like you need a buddy system. Right, yeah. Um, you know, when we go to BJJ, if I miss, I, I had to travel last week. And uh, one of my partners, like, texts me. And he's like, you missed two days. What's going on? You know? And I think you got to have people that hold you accountable. Sure. And I think, like, as we flow through, I mean, I've, I've a firm belief, and we talked a little bit off camera on this, um, you know, I'm – I try not to be tribal. I think tribal fucking deal is extremely scary mm-hmm. for me, especially in this present climate. But we end up kind of, I use the term tribe, like we find our tribe of people. It's called Ken selection in psychology, right? Yeah. You, you decide based on whatever factors you choose or whatever you're influenced by, who your Ken, who your family is, yeah. right? That's what it is. And then, you know, you, you have these people around you and the secret to it is allowing people to hold you accountable. Mm-hmm. And even when... It's a po- it, it hurts or it's not right. You need people. And, you know, the emperor's new clothes deal where now all of a sudden you want to surround your people with yes men. We see this happen to rich people constantly. Oh, yeah. You get all this money. You well, know that's why long- Trump's got that haircut. He does because nobody told him. He yeah. looked like fucking ridiculous. Yeah. And, uh, and as long as you have people around you that are honest with you and hold you accountable, then you find, like, your true center. Mm. And you know what? Like, everybody needs to know they're fucking up. And, um, you know, all of a sudden, whether it be your significant other, oh, it's just easier to get divorced unless my wife bitching me because I drink too much right, or yeah, this and this. Yeah. Well, fuck, dude, it could be a real problem. And uh, I think we're in this idea of, like, uh, I just wanted everything to be comfortable and easy, but we didn't survive like that. Well, that's because we added the pursuit of happiness to the end of those other things mm. because happiness is the result of doing the right thing. It well, is not it, – It's there's no pursuit of happiness. That's nonsense. Uh, I think happy uh, – I think um, – the weirdest statement I've ever heard mm. is if you ask somebody, are you happy? 
or yeah. somebody ever asked you. And you I, what and do you I, mean, like right now? Well, but because uh, what the fuck does that mean? It, it, I, I don't know what it means. So I, I asked my mom that one time, or my mm. mom asked me. I can't remember. She's like, "Are you happy?" And I was like, "How do you define happiness? Mm. Like, like do I feel content? Yeah, like, yeah. like what is happiness? Is it content? Is it positivity? Is it self worth? Like, mm. what does it feel to be happy?" And I think you're right. That's a weird piece. Mm. But for me, um, uh, so. Um, I'm sure you've seen, like, they, they had that huge finish study with uh, saunas. Yep. So they found that, like, over 170, there was this heat shock proteins, and mm-hmm. there was all these physiological effects, mm-hmm. and that if you were to get in the sauna five days a week for, you know, let's say a total of 60 minutes, your chances of going to a heart attack go down to, like, 0.001. Yeah, yeah. So as men, there's two ways we're going to die. It's either heart attack or cancer. Right. It's, like, going to kill 95% yep. of us. So. If you get into a sauna five, you know, three days, it goes down to 70. And, you know, basically you can get it down to zero. Mm -hmm. Um, I was always really fascinated why that is the case. Okay. And you go through all the physiology. Mm -hmm. You know, why does uh, exercise or why does getting into a cold plunge, like why do these things increase longevity? Mm -hmm. And uh, I never really got a good explanation until I read... um, And I'm going to tell... I forget his name, but he wrote a book called Longevity. And he's a... English dude, and I'm totally remembering, forgetting his name. He's got a podcast. He was on Huberman's Deal. Um, messing his name up, but I'm sure you'll pull it up. I'm looking. Um, Peter Atia, maybe? No, not Peter Atia. Let's see. Uh, he's a little dude. It was uh, just called Longevity? Yeah, um, oh, it's called Lifespan. I'm sorry. Oh, Lifespan. Lifespan, yeah, Lifespan is uh, uh, David Sinclair. Yeah, yeah. so David Sinclair, oh, yeah, there in, it is. David in Sinclair. his book, has an interesting deal where he talks about positive gene expression that when you put yourself into these situations where you're close to like within death, like you're close to like, you know, as you're exercising, you hit that hit of like that euphoric hit of like, Mm. holy shit, uh, that type of deal. Or you get into, it's really hot where all of a sudden you get in, you get this response of like, I've been in here too long. I got to get out or die. Or you get into the cold. Mm. What happens is, is when you put yourself in these situations, these life or death moments, or whether it be real or not, or how we imagine yeah. it, yeah. the gene expression is positive that your body's on your side. It's no longer autoimmune. Mm-hmm. It's basically pro-immune, where now the body's like, we're in this together, positive gene expression. Mm-hmm. If you sit on the couch and do nothing and live with comfort, overeat, and are a lazy piece of shit, that does you, nothing. You're, you're telling your body it doesn't need to do the shit. And do you know it what it does? To do. It stops doing it that stops, shit. It stops, but yeah, it becomes... Yeah autoimmune it and it kills you off yeah. that you're a waste of space you're a waste of space you're a waste yeah, of resources yeah. you no longer should yeah. be here so now i'm going to kill you sure. off and think about that from you've all seen examples of like atrophied muscles think about the holocaust for example with yeah. people who haven't eaten or been able to do anything for a while and you see what it does to their body now imagine that at the cellular level imagine yeah. imagine it at the psychological level even well, think when you're not mentally. testing yourself just neuroplasticity in general I don't think people understand how the brain works very well. Well, think about um, think about the people that just plug in and watch Fox News. Oh yeah, right, oh, and, and don't have any or critical thinking. Any of the other ones. And, yeah. well, but it and it makes me nervous because uh, I um, uh, I'm libertarian in that I like I'm libertarian in the idea of like I want smaller government mm. and more personal responsibility. Mm. If you look at our founding fathers, it was the idea of like you know personal responsibility was like the most massive. And I got all these quotes and different things I pulled in which was Thomas Jefferson, cherish therefore the spirit of our people and keep alive their attention. If once they become uh, inattentive to the public affairs, you and I in Congress and the assemblies, judges and governors shall all become wolves. And it seems to be the law of uh, general nature, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like vigilance, uh, personal responsibility, Mm -hmm. all these things, like you have to be vigilant. And that peace, um, you know, kind of puts me in this like smaller government. Let me keep more money. Let me make my own decisions. Let me govern myself. Uh, but then I get super nervous when all of a sudden you start talking to somebody and they start parroting Fox news as much as these other fucking idiots on the Mm -hmm. other side. And I get real nervous when all of a sudden, like people are too far to one side. Like I, I I probably like you, I'm, um, I'm probably fiscally conservative Mm -hmm. and I'm socially like, Hey, you know what? You live your best life yeah, yeah. and stop huh. asking me yeah. permission to live your life. Why do you need me to co-sign? Like mm-hmm. I am um, like gay marriage is a classic example. Sure. Um, right. Uh, the day, the day that the U S government came in and required me to purchase a, a, a marriage certificate and I got a tax deduction, uh, by filed jointly to the IRS, mm-hmm. it no longer became this like within God deal, this, this civil union. Sure, it yeah. became a fucking uh, contract, partnership. Yeah. yeah. It became a contract. Yeah. So then to deny people, 
like uh, two people of the same sex to deny them the right to have a civil partnership, to be able to take tax deductions. You can't do that. So like, I, I'm like, okay, well, like if you want to make sure, you know, if you wanted to say marriage, then you know what? Don't give me any financial fucking benefit from it. Like if this is what happens in the church, two people, two union, do I get mm-hmm. it? Sure. But that you can't deny somebody else. But at the end of the day, whether or not I agree with it or not, why does it fucking matter? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. Who you cares, can live yeah. your best life. Like if, if, if two dudes want to get married, great. If you want to bake them a cake, bake it. If you don't want to bake them a cake, I don't care. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. Yeah. But like the, the problem with a lot of what we're running into is now people want you to accept or co-sign, you have to do this and be like, dude, I don't care. Yeah, you don't get uh, control. Well, the problem is, the problem arises when you do care. Like you're entitled to not fucking deal with people you don't want to deal with. I just no shirt, shirt, no suit, no shoes, no service. Yeah. It says it right there on the sign. And look, dude. man, it, post about it on social media and call them dicks. That's fine. That's your right to do that yeah. as well. And if people who agree with you won't go shop there. Yeah. The market has fucking solved the problem. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, what the yeah. fuck? Why, are you, why is the government getting involved well, in like, any of this? If you're an asshole, then people don't buy from you. Correct. And they yeah. avoid you. Yeah. And you know what? Like at the end of the day, like don't be in a fucking insensitive asshole. Yeah. Like let people live their life. And I, uh, I, I like, I don't ask people permission to live my life. Mm-hmm. Right? I just do it. Like I don't like, you know, I don't get on social media and go, you know, you have to accept. I don't give a fuck about that. Because yeah, like, I don't want to ask anybody's opinion. Well, why, so, do you, why do you think it's so common now that people don't just want to do what they want to do. They, they want you to approve of it. Over, they, they want to force you through a struggle <sighs> session to approve I, of their behavior. I fucking, this is... that is, like some deep-seated insecurity uh, or is it, it just authoritarianism from the bottom? Is it like, it's like power bottom authoritarianism. I, I like, I, so, so this is where I, uh, we talked earlier about uh, empathy and the, mm-hmm. like being able to understand somebody's argument and then occasionally things are a bridge too far. Mm-hmm. I think for me personally, this becomes a bridge too far where I don't really understand people's need for acceptance. But I think what it has to do is it goes back to like maybe uh, evolution, right? So Mm -hmm. think about this, like we didn't grow, like we're not designed as humans to live with this many connections. Right. And I think there was a book, I think it's Tribes talked about this. It's good, yeah. Yeah, so we're we're, we're designed for about 150 human connections, right, max. So what happened was we grew up in these like kind of small collective, let's say like hunting camp, right? Like Mm -hmm. hunter gatherers. the biggest fear that people had was lack of acceptance because if you were an asshole and you weren't accepted, they threw you outside the wall (laughs) and you got eat by the... There were actual consequences. Yeah, there were consequences. You got thrown outside the wall and therefore you... Uh, weren't didn't have access to fire, warmth, mm. food, protection, and all the things that people are searching for. So you're an asshole. People don't accept you. They throw you outside and you get eaten by wolves right. or, or fucking bears. Mm. So I think that the inherent desire for people to garner acceptance goes back into an evolutionary trait of trying to find their tribe for protection. Sure, yeah. So the only thing I can figure out is these individuals fall far below, uh, you know, and I really fucking hate the... Um, Anybody that writes a book on how to be an alpha is not a fucking Anybody alpha. that says they're an alpha is not an Anybody alpha. Anybody that actually <laughs> uses the term alpha oh, yeah. and beta is a yeah. fuck. It is not. Like, <laughs> it, you're fucking out. You're like, and, and if you try to tell people your alpha is fuck and this is what you write the books, yeah. I just hope you die in a fucking uh, in fiery a Chemical like, fire, yeah. It's <laughs> fucking awful to me. And I don't know where all this came from. Oh, my God. It's the cringiest shit. It, well, it, it comes is. from the same spot. Look, and I, I appreciate the... I appreciate the analysis to show the difference between the things because ultimately you're trying to to push people towards being more independent and stuff. But that, but if you have to read a book on how to be an alpha, it's yeah, fucking it's too like far a self help book. It, it's, it's awful. There's no such thing as self help. No, it's help. So if you get it from somebody else, right? Um, what's really fascinating and my favorite time in history. So like I said, I was a rhetoric classics major, and they're like my most favorite time in history and what I refer to is the time when the old gods had died Mm. and before the new God was born. So um, at the end of the Roman empire, Mm. uh, they had like so many gods. It was so many confusing. Like Mm. they just like fucking just went away, you know, uh, Jesus Christ, whether or not you believe that there was a man Mm. named Jesus Christ and the, you know, the son of God, whatever you believe. Um, I just believe that there was probably a great man named Jesus Mm. and who taught, you know, and if you look at the teachings, could they be Buddhist? Could they be Hindus? Who knows? But there's this individual in history. And then what happened was Jesus, passed away the apostles and then over the next couple hundred years Jesus, uh, Christianity became a cult religion sure, and yeah. almost destroyed the Roman Empire yep. but until Constantine a, adopted it because he on, saw yeah, the flow, on his deathbed right? yeah, because he yeah. saw it tearing it apart yep. but there was a time where all of a sudden the Roman gods were no longer of value 
Mm-hmm. And it was before Christianity really took hold. Mm-hmm. And it's a couple hundred years. And that's when you get like Cicero, Marcus Aurelius, uh, you get the cynics, you get the, uh, the Stoics. Yep. And these individuals in this most amazing time within history and philosophy and human development existed in this small time frame yeah. because the old gods had died. The new god hadn't mm-hmm. come in. We, we didn't have a monolithic uh, a religion. And there was this personal responsibility. And there's a reason why Marcus Aurelius' meditation still su- survives. Mm-hmm. And Cicero, who, who uh, is by far my favorite person within history, um, you know, his uh, uh, part of my company, we, we do a lot of branding around Memento Mori. I mean, you know, that comes from... Uh, yeah, I, I've I, got a I Memento Mori that. tattoo right yeah. here. So. I, I attribute that to Cicero. He's yeah, yeah. really the first rhetorician, the first lawyer. Mm-hmm. And I still count, if you look at my social, I list myself as a modern rhetorician. Uh, so then you have like Marcus Aurelius, you have all these incredible Seneca. thinkers, Seneca, yeah. uh, and, and yeah. these Stoics. The reason that that information has survived because it was about the individual. Mm-hmm. We no longer look to the skies and look to somebody else. Like, you know, the idea that the, we're just pawns that the gods move around, all that was gone. Like we didn't have the influence of religion. So the, the, the impetus, the, uh, uh emphasis, the, the, you know, everything was shouldered on the individual. And if you read that information, uh, it's about personal improvement. It's about sure, you yeah. as the yeah, individual. Yeah. Yep. You are the captain of your own ship. And you know what? A ship at harbor is safe, but then what the fuck were ships made for? Well, yeah, but you can't control a person that thinks like that, right? That's true. It's, it's, the, reason and, that, it's the reason that the church kept people. It, they kept the Bible in Latin until 1511 AD. Yeah. So poor fucking peasants couldn't read it. Yeah, of course. Because they want to control access to God. That's all well, it was. I mean, and, and if you really want to know uh, all the information of history, it's probably under buried underneath the Vatican. Oh, yeah. I would with love six there, miles yeah. of fucking catacombs. Yeah. Right? So, uh, but for me, uh, in college, as I, and it, it's hilarious that all of a sudden social media started and everybody became a Stoic in this. I read the oh, Cynics. Yeah. I read the Stoics. Like all of these mm-hmm. people, like this was what, like this was my major. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I fucking loved it. And uh, it I'm is, done. I, I do agree. I think it's the most brilliant point in human history because you also had augustus who was the, probably the first autocratic leader who aligned his ego with the welfare of society i think that's a big thing like if you're if you have that level of ego where you think you can rule over other people uh it can go wrong really fast as well, his fucking well, his lineage did after that after the well, pax romana right you're you're talking about benevolence yeah um there's a benevolent dictator is a good idea in, in a lot yeah, of cases but, but the problem is is that uh one we've never had one no uh, i mean he was and, he was close well, he, he was yeah. close yeah. but i mean you like you take a look and You're i still a dick. like one of my favorites is uh socialism always becomes a little co- is a little communism oh, socialism yeah. Yeah, always yeah, grows yeah. into communism yeah. and the problem is is that the person that claws his way to the top mm. is by far the most ruthless motherfucker so we've never had that that's what i always hate this idea with well we've never done socialism right yeah well it's because yeah. it's always grown into communism yeah, yeah socialism yeah, yeah. only exists okay like i'll just give you an example if this was our kingdom mm-hmm. and you and i were here we can have a socialist right existence you know why because i know you and i look you in the eye and we have to be accountable sure. the minute that you step into the other room and you're making decisions on a door that's shut with people in here mm-hmm. socialism doesn't exist because there's zero accountability right yeah you know yeah, it's 100 percent true i mean yeah. look at uh look at stalin I mean, Jesus, like that. Uh, yeah, he I was mean, just like deeply paranoid, deeply insecure, five foot eight piece of shit. Yeah, that's well, what he well, was. Well, ap- after his wife died, he said, uh, "You know, like I have no more warmth, like nothing." Yeah. So, and he just yeah. proceeded to execute everybody. Yeah. But I thought, uh, you know, for all his faults, I thought Trump was very similar in that regard, ego wise, and and obviously the social media stuff hurt him. But if he, if Trump had been president like in the nineteen fifties, I think he would have been far more successful. Oh. Because Dude. it's it's like it's somebody who aligns themselves with the eye. Like I actually want this to work. He's a businessman, yeah. right? So it's like I, the, well, the results and his are very obvious. Business works if America works. Yeah. So so the problem is is that we have leaders that have no vested interest in the success of America. No, they're just extracting wealth. Yeah, they're, that's, they're, that's all they're bilking. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know what? And the fact that we have this much data, this much information, mm-hmm. and this much smoking gun pointed to the Biden crime syndicate, mm-hmm. and yet nothing has happened, and you see him sh- and, uh, I'm super uh, conflicted with Biden in many ways, in that uh, he's obviously in the throes of dementia. Oh, yeah, he's um, got You see the shuffling sure. feet. They, yeah. they actually, I think, I think they have uh, some back brace on him now. 
because what happens is, is as you get into dementia and this mm -hmm. deal, you start getting this reptilian like turtle, yeah. like rolling yeah. forward with his eyes. So they got him whacked on the Adderall and Modafinil and all these different drugs, and they even have a brace on him. Hey, but you see him shuffling his feet. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's literally textbook. And you see him get up there, and it's, I mean, we're, we're making jokes about his public speaking because it's so awful. Mm -hmm. For me, it's elderly abuse. And the fact that his wife and whoever yeah. the fuck it is putting him out there and yeah. having his legacy, I mean, his legacy is a shitty one because he's a shitty human being. He yeah, always yeah. has been. Yeah, he's he, always um, been rough. I mean, he, you know, what people forget was uh, he the had to walk on a presidential ride because he lied. Yeah. He's lied about everything. Yeah, he could have, he, he may have been the, the 1988 uh, 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 Democratic nominee instead of, who, who was it? Uh, who was ran it against Walter Mondale? Bush? Yeah, Mondale. Yeah. It would have been him. Oh, wait, was it Mondale? Well, it was Walter Mondo ran against Reagan. Yeah, that was 84. 84. Because uh, it was Carter, Reagan, and 80. And then, uh, uh, who was fuck. it? Fuck. Uh, I don't remember who it was, but... I thought it, it was Walter it, Mondale. No, that was... I think it was 84. I, it, it, let me check, actually. Hold on. And then you had Ross Perot. Well, that was... He fucked everything up. Yeah, that um, was the third county candidate. Let's see. Oh, it was Dukakis. Ah, right, Dukakis, yeah. right. So it Michael Dukakis. It would have been Joe Biden... Had he not gotten caught multiple times over the past well, he, couple of years plagiarizing shit, well, and and, and uh, you know his whole deal where he was having an affair with this gal and she's <laughs> married. I mean, yeah. like he's a fucking scumbag, and yeah. he always has been. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Like I don't know why. I mean, I like I uh, I remember my dad telling me that um, Joe Biden personally did more to destroy the black community. Uh, you know, even more, maybe more so than Richard mm -hmm. Nixon. Yeah. So, uh, like, he's always been a piece of shit. But the problem is, and this is what's crazy. Like, you know, in this, you know. Trump was so hated, and I believe it was it was the laser beam. Because, I mean, think about all the crazy shit Biden's done that oh, yeah. the media just ignores. Yeah. Trump, like, if Trump walked over, like, uh, I, I think it was in, um, I can't remember, like, one of, like, the foreign leader things. They were all standing there, and Trump, like, moved in front of everybody mm -hmm. to give himself a better position. They fucking eviscerated him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, like, they attacked yeah. Obama when he wore a tan suit. Yeah, that's Remember stupid. that? Yeah. You got Biden shitting his pants. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, I mean, and, yeah. and like... But they're they, definitely going out of the way to prop this dude up. Which is for, crazy to For me. some reason. Yeah. Right? I, mean, I mean, so so they it, it's a joke that if your kid shits in the tub, it's code brown. Uh, yeah, yeah. I believe that they have a code brown. That's why they yeah. yank him out because he, he fucking shits himself. He definitely shit himself at the Vatican. He totally 100%. did. 100%. Yeah. Um, and then uh, apparently because the... I mean, uh, if you're shitting Camilla yourself. Camilla Bowles Parker, the, the king's wife now, I yeah. guess she's technically, I don't know if she's a queen. Or uh, a she's current. called, uh, is it the consort? She's queen weird, consort, maybe, yeah. Because yeah. it's, queen. yeah, maybe that's it. But she's, uh, she got interviewed by a bunch of people, or I'm sorry, people that were at those parties said she was talking about how he was just like fucking shit in his pants. Yeah. So, well, I, I mean, it seems like unlikely that it didn't happen. You saw Gordon Ryan pulled out of that this pen fight. He's supposed uh, to fight no, this weekend. No. I don't know if you're into BJJ, but um, you know Gordon Ryan's like the top guy in the yeah, world yeah. in no, in no yeah. gi, and so he's got this fight with Penna coming up, and he pulled out mm -hmm. like last night, two days before, and because he's got stomach issues. Mm -hmm. I mean, he probably was more worried. He's been he's had diarrhea and he's had stomach issues for yeah, for yeah. a long time, but he's probably more worried that he was going out there to go grapple this dude. What if he shit himself? To me, that was way more embarrassing than pulling out of the fight two days prior and taking yeah, the yeah, social media. Yeah, I mean, you can always reschedule a fight. You can't fucking erase video of you shitting yourself, dude, <laughs> especially uh, not wrestling with another dude. Oh, my God. But, like, uh, so this is what's hard for me is that, you know, we're the most powerful nation on the on the planet, mm -hmm. and our commander-in-chief is not making decisions. Sure. It's obviously, um, you know, in the throes of dementia and not within his faculties. Mm. And yet, you know, it was like Ronald Reagan at the end when Nancy Reagan was signing yeah, these yeah. things. It's, um, I'm I'm almost glad it's happening now because I I what I hope happens is that people see the absurdity of all this and be like you know what these motherfuckers aren't going to help me I got to start helping myself this, this this is the only the only way we're going to people are talking about national divorce and whatever the fuck else and look I don't I don't get romantic about the fact that there's 50 states to me America is not a geographical location and it's not it sure as fuck is not our government it is the idea that individual liberty is the ultimate inoculation yeah. to tyrannical bullshit. Yeah. That's how our entire system from federalism to individual rights and the Bill of Rights, that's how it's all created, right? That's what I believe. And if you're California you don't believe that anymore, fuck, that's fine. Yeah. Go. Do, we, do what we want to do, dude. Fuck off. Do whatever you want to do, but I'm not going to be ruled by anybody. Well, I mean, that was part of our move to Texas. Mm -hmm. I, I, I no longer, and I told my dad, I can no longer with good conscience pay taxes and pay into a state mm -hmm. where, one, they don't represent us, I don't support any of the programs, and I don't yeah. support any of the deal. I can no longer, and my dad told me you can't abandon her 
And I was like, Dad, it's a fucking dying star. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, we yeah. got to move. Yeah. And you know what? And we moved. Thank God we moved before Joe Rogan. Mm-hmm. And uh, whatever the hell Joe Rogan did to this Austin place, it, like we thought we were moving to the country. And like Joe Rogan moved, started talking about how great it was, and people came here and drove. It us. hasn't even gotten started yet. <laughs> like seriously, I, I think Dallas all the way down to San Antonio is going to be one big metro sometime in the next 15 or 20 years probably, wow. yeah. But yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad this is happening because at least a lot of people are, are doing what you did. Um, I've, I mean, frankly, I've always, I grew up like this. Just, I'm not, I don't tell me what to do. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But, uh, also that comes at a price and it's the purpose of this show. Citizen, you can sit around and bitch and moan about your rights and let them be secured by a government or somebody else. And you're going to be their subject or you can do it yourself. So, uh, Rob Wolf, who's one Mm -hmm. of my oldest friends in the world, uh, Rob made an interesting statement when he said, um, taking a hold of your health and being the master of your own destiny mm. in terms of health, performance, and fitness is the greatest form of revolution you can do. Yeah. And he started his uh, his deal on it, and I'm paraphrasing him. I think I butchered his quote. But uh, I've always viewed as, uh, one, I have never looked for the – like if uh, the power goes out, I'm not – calling the you know i'll wait for it to come back on i gotta yeah, yeah, yeah right if my trees fall down i'm not calling the city to come do them i'll deal with them myself right, yeah. um you know if uh if, if i have to deal with something i will deal with it as an individual and i look at personal responsibility mm. as my social contract of living in this country is not depending on anybody uh, I, I once saw a sign where um, this guy held it up and he said, if something bad happens in America, nobody's sending aid, nobody's sending to right, help yeah, us. Yeah. You know, uh, the Ukraine gets attacked by Russia. What do we, we go help? Um, you know, there's uh, uh, something happens in Haiti. Look at all these places. The America, go, I mean, America goes, we go to fucking help everybody. Yeah. If something bad happens in here, you don't think everybody's going to be lining up to laugh at us and be like, we ain't oh, fucking yeah. helping those motherfuckers. Yeah. Yeah, nobody's nobody's coming to help. No, and, and you know, I mean, why would you expect them to? Well, to uh, be the honest? the only people that I would expect to come help are people. What, what did you call it? Kinship within the tribe. Ken, well, kin selection is the kin, process yeah. by which. But yeah, it's your it's your tribe basically. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's kind of like uh, like I'll see you battling on Twitter, and mm-hmm. I jump in. Mm-hmm. You know why? Because I know we're boys, yeah, yeah. and I support you. <laughs> And you know what? Like, and I'm sure you've seen me come in there, and I try oh, yeah. to like, yeah. And you're like, ah, oh, fucking Walmart's going to drop some bones, yeah. right? And, and anytime and like, I see your name pop up, I think it's going to be something fun. Yeah, and I try to make fun of people, and I try mm-hmm. to have a good sense of humor and make things lighthearted. But I think it really comes down to, um, you know, one uh, figuring out who who you support and who supports mm-hmm. you, and then creating self reliance. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if you have to like. I just get real nervous when all of a sudden we're we're become so dependent in this nanny state, and mm. that fucking makes me nervous. Like that's my greatest fear. Well, the solution to that is obvious, in my opinion. It's like if um, th- this is this is my advice. If you're tired of the big government influence in your life, then you find problems in your local area that the government's currently solving, and you go solve them yourself, right? Whether they're your problems or somebody else's. And then you empower that person to fucking start solving their own problems as well. And all of a sudden, the government has uh, no more influence. If The only reason that people fucking comply with any of this shit is because of the leverage that the government has over them or the, the benefits they provide them, mm. right? And if you're getting those benefits from the people in your area, then that's who you'll trust. That's yeah. who you'll depend on. And, and then you realize that, you know, it isn't enough to take i mean even even jfk said it's not about what the country can do for you like the reason this exists is because of the of hard work and 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 temperance and uh you know a good attitude that's the the only way it's like a star battling between uh nuclear uh fusion and gravity right those two things are symbiotic they balance the star out and it stays a solid object and if one of the other takes over then it either fucking blows up or implodes well, um, so so here's another issue that, that I've been really wrestling with. Um, you know, this whole green agenda, the idea that like, we're pushing into these electric <laughs> yeah, cars. Stupid. Uh, I saw a pretty interesting deal, and I'd, I'd have to pull it up, but the guy basically went through and calculated, like, okay, from a raw material standpoint, mm-hmm. how much lithium, how much cobalt, how much all these different uh, products do we need in terms of creating batteries and building these cars, and went through the whole thing, and he looked at actually the load of raw materials that we, we would need per car. Mm-hmm. And then they were to basically analyze how much we've mined, mm. how much is available, and how much is on the earth based off of like a you know, certain expectation, based off of how much they pull out of the ground. And we don't have the raw materials in place 
to actually execute anywhere near what they're doing. Sure, that's why there's only six million fucking electric vehicles well, yeah. right now. And, and then the problem the is, is, million vehicles. is you can only put wind in places that have uh, like uh, uh, wind turbines yep. in places that have wind, right. and you can <clears throat> only run solar in places that have sun. Mm-hmm. So if you're in Texas and like you know the down south, yeah, where we have sun in Florida, it works. What about in Maine? Yeah, what the fuck yeah. are you going to do that? And, and then you, now you create a scenario where the people in Texas have power over the people in Maine. Well, do you know how you build right. the the, uh, uh, the electricity there? It's got to be done with coal. Yeah. So, I mean, we're in a situation where the narrative that's being pushed in this green thing um, and, you know, this uh, de- desire for, you know, this whole the green, it, it doesn't exist. No, it's not. Like, it's a fool's errand. It is. Stupid. And and they're, uh, uh, you know, and they're putting us in a terrible situation. And I listened to an interesting talk with Jordan Peterson where he talked about uh, cheap energy is mm-hmm. like the greatest way that you can pull people out of poverty. Yeah. And the problem is, is oh, that he was talking to uh, Alex. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, he was Epst- on his podcast. Epstein, yeah. yeah it, was, it was incredible. Yeah. I've got his yeah. book right here, actually. Yeah. Fossil Future. Yeah. 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 Uh, I, I yeah. listened to the podcast with him mm-hmm. and talked about the great, if you want to pull people out of poverty and you want to save the environment, make everybody wealthy. So now all of a sudden they stop burning trash and shit in the street. Right. And so that 70% of the world still burns wood. For yeah. energy, 70% for energy. of the entire world. So he's like, if you can pull these people out of poverty yep. and you can give cheap energy, you'll pull people out and then they'll start looking to save the environment. Right. The problem is they're driving up energy costs, which effectively is more Klaus Schwab population reduction. Yeah. Because yeah. now you're going to make it so difficult for these people to heat themselves. And I always go back with, I think it was Randall Carlson, uh, who who's you know on Joe Rogan, mm. who's uh, you know one of the... Uh, you know, the dude that, that analyzes all the topography, mm. he made a, a great point that's extremely chilling to me. He goes, I don't worry about uh, climate change and global warming. I worry about global cooling. Mm. And he goes, you Yeah, know, people don't die from heat very yeah. often. He goes, dude, he goes, uh, it's one thing. Like, if it's hot, like, people mm. can deal with it. Obviously, you know, people live in the Middle East, it's 127 degrees, yeah. there's air conditioning, there's ways to manage this thing. The problem is when you get into global cooling and we're just in between ice ages, that's when shit goes awry. The largest population centers on Earth, aside from major <sighs> economic, uh, economically driven cities, are near the equator. Yeah. You know what I mean? Look they're they're not in the fucking Arctic. No, no. There's, <laughs> There's not a lot of people live there because yeah. you have to. <laughs> Stupid. I, uh, I, I was super fortunate. I got asked to speak uh, at a security for national or uh, at a conference on national security mm-hmm. for the um, for the War College uh, out in uh, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. And the speak or the part that I spoke on was the greatest threat to national security was a lack of physical fitness for kids between the ages of 16 and 18 that would be eligible to be entering the military. Right. But a bigger issue was the lack of physical readiness, capacity, and physical fitness and health for people that were like 26 to like 40, which mm. if you think about it, if something bad were to happen, those are the individuals that would call out the militia, right? The right. lack yeah, of readiness yeah. and yeah. physical ability. And, uh, uh, you know, the problem is, is uh, like less than 20 to 25% of kids 16 to 18 are actually physically fit and eligible enough to enter the military. Yeah, right? yeah so, they're having big problems Yeah, they're now. having huge so problems. Low, right. t- low testosterone and, and bone density are problems. So when uh, in the Marine Corps now, when a recruit joins up, they start giving them supplements immediately. Yeah. They get like a vitamin D shot and yeah. all kinds of other shit. It's so, fucked up. So we, uh, I'll, I'll just give you another little mm. funny antidote uh, about three years ago, I had my shoulders scoped, mm-hmm. um, you know, obviously take a bunch of heat. And, um, and my shoulders got to the point where like, I needed to have it cleaned out. So I yeah. went down to uh, Dr. Ants, who um, is uh, the head of regen for Dr. Andrews down in Florida. Mm-hmm. So he scoped my shoulder. And after they got done, they basically tap the hip, they pull out marrow, spin it down, they inject mm-hmm. it back in as a way to kind of increase healing. So I get done. Uh, next day he calls me and he's like, man, we uh, pulled the marrow out of your hip. Mm-hmm. And he's like, dude, like we pulled out, I forgot what he pulled out in the amount, but he's like, basically the stem cell count that we pulled out out of whatever they pulled 10 cc's, he's like, was was off the charts. Mm-hmm. He goes, it was so. And like, that's indicative of your biological age. Well, he, right? yeah. Yeah. So he, he goes, it was off the charts. He goes so much so that it's probably not going to be able to use in our study because it was such an outlier. Mm-hmm. And he goes, as we were, and then he goes right after you, we brought in a 20 year old kid who was a football player at a major division one school, similar shoulder scope. After we were done, we tapped his hip. Uh, we had to tap both hips and we pulled 10. We pulled 20 out of both of his hips and his stem cell count was half of yours. And he goes, not only, he goes, dude, he goes, it was a difference in not only color mm. and thickness. He goes, your stem cell count was double and we pulled out almost like 40 to your 10. So, you know, four times what we had and his was half. 
And Makes sense. And then he said the other thing is he goes, as we were going and working on you, cutting through, grinding to everything, he goes, when we worked on the other kid, uh, the you know the people that were assisting were like, dude, like the physical difference. And his joke was like the older models. And he's like, this is a different model. He goes, because yeah. he's the same size as you. Yeah. You know, I'm six five and a half, six mm-hmm. six, like 275 pounds now. And he goes, kid, same size. He goes, but just the insertions, the bone density, mm-hmm. the thickness was so dramatically different that we shouldn't see that and a guy that's double his age. Sure. And so his whole thing is that the kids today just not as durable. Now, I think it comes down to diet. Mm. I think it comes down to training. I think it comes down to load. All these other key factors. Um, it's just, I, I really think that we're in a serious fucking problem. Yeah, we are. I mean, we're, we're uh, it, it's selective breeding almost, right? Or selective, evo- uh, uh, selective De- evolution. De-evolution. Yeah, it's because... If you sit around, your body's going to think that's what you do, right? And you're going to lose the ability to be active. That's yeah. not great. Um, well, we've, we've effectively added so much comfort in mm-hmm. the world. And I, like, I, I'm, I'm be the first one to say that technology is great. I mean, mm-hmm. the fact that we're sitting here having this, you know, esoteric discussion mm-hmm. uh, and being able to, like, you know, project this out in the world is an amazing thing. But at the end of the day, like, you know, it's, uh, you want to go shake somebody's hand. And when you shake their hand, you want to know that they actually do work for a living. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, there's nothing worse than a weak handshake. Um, oh, so soft. Yeah, it's it's gross. Uh, so we got to get out of here. Okay. Is there anything else you'd like to share with these dicks? Uh, no, man. If um, uh, if you want to get a hold of me, I'm real easy to find at mm-hmm. John Wellborn on social. Mm-hmm. You can find me at PowerAthleteHQ.com. We have a podcast, Power Athlete Radio. I talk mainly about performance, strength, conditioning, and try to introduce some intelligent people that are doing cool shit. I don't really dive too much into the political stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, just because it's not really our audience per right. se, yeah, yeah. but I do enjoy coming on this because this is important to me, and this is really the focus, mm. uh, you know, within my conversations and what I read. You know, personal responsibility, you know, training. Um, you know, uh, for me, it's always about sharpening the blade, mm. uh, and you know, not only you know being uh, physically able, but you know, being able to fucking still open a can of whoop ass and fuck yeah. people up on a moment's notice. I mean the the. Uh the reality of the situation is that most of the most modern men aren't going to be ready for this fight. That's just how it is. No. So you need to get ready and you'll not, not just for yourself, but you also need to, aside from the fitness and general skills, you need to start learning leadership skills as well, because it's going to be on the people that are taking advantage of this kind of material to teach other people when it's, when shit goes down. You know what I mean? Yeah. We, I mean, uh, I really work with people in terms of like uh, physical performance and mm-hmm. trying to make them more ready. But I really think that uh, as uh, an adult at this point, you need to not only with skill acquisition, you need to be able to use mm-hmm. your hands, be able to be able to create and build things, fix things, but you also be proficient if violence comes to your door. Yep. And uh, the one thing that I, I remember, I think I told Evan Halford this years ago when he asked me, uh, you know, was I a good football player? Mm-hmm. And I was like, I don't know if I was a good football player, but I was really good at managing violence. Mm-hmm. And I viewed myself as a master of violence. Yeah. So violence and, and combat always made me very calm. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that allowed me to do my job. And yeah. uh, I think you have to become comfortable with the uncomfortable and put yourself into enough situations where you just become proficient in stressful situations. And I, I really feel um, nervous for the people that don't realize, and not that I'm a you know doomsday or this and mm-hmm. this, but like I, I'm smart enough to f- see the fight coming at us, and uh, I don't want to be unprepared. Yeah. Yeah, you definitely want to expose yourself to some low-level violence and conflict resolution yeah. before it's time to. This idea that you're just gonna fucking like I'll I'll perform in the moment. Like, no, you won't. You won't. Well, that's an interesting one. That somehow, like, this is my favorite too. People go buy a gun and they think all of a sudden the bullets are fired and they're gonna be fucking John Wick. Yeah. Or all of a sudden they get into a trouble and they're gonna throw a punch and know how to do it. And then all mm. of a sudden you're like. Uh, this dude's been fucking fighting for 20 years and he's fucking got a, you know, fucking purple belt in jujitsu. He's mm. not only going to fucking smash you on both sides. Right. So I think like having proficiency, um, you know, I, I, I really, uh, um, I personally hate laying on my back. Mm. That's the thing. Like my, my hardest thing with jujitsu is the idea of like being on my back. So I never pull guard. I never go turtle and I just try to fucking smash. But, uh, I think, uh, finding something that allows you to find your tribe and continue to train and I think you got to lift weights, you got to eat well, uh, you got to sleep, you got to like do everything you can, and mm. you got to do something combative to sharpen your fucking spirit. Sure, hundred percent. 
I agree with that. So, uh, yeah, well, look, I appreciate you coming on today. Dude, thank you so it's much been, for having me. I've been trying to get you on for a while, but we've been all over the fucking yeah. place. Well, dude, uh, uh, I really enjoyed it. Anytime yeah. you want to rap about this shit, man, for I sure. can talk about this stuff at, at, uh, at, at nauseum to the end of the day. Same, yeah. We'll do it again sometime soon. Uh, thanks again for coming. Yes, sir. Thank you all for watching. This has been Citizen.